everybody, welcome. Um, I think we are ready to get started. So I am so happy to welcome you all here to our announce, uh, to our Cybercraft panel. And this is, I want to emphasize that this panel, and in fact, um, our visiting scholars and entire visit this year has all been made possible by the generosity of the late Alan Smith. And so I just wanted to take a minute to talk about Alan and his legacy. Um, Alan Smith was one of the longest serving members of Split. Uh, but he was also a true Renaissance man. Uh, he wrote what I believe is still the definitive work of the Appalachian dogma. I brought my copy if you would like to take a look. Um, I'm pretty sure it's still unrivaled in the field. Um, then when he was not teaching, researching, and writing, he also worked as a farrier. Um, in other words, he chewed horses on the side. So he really was a Renaissance man. But for those of us who are lucky enough to know him, I think he'll always be remembered as someone who was devoted to the science, art, and um, his particular areas of study in LIS were Russian services, oral history, and humanities librarianship. Um, and in fact, it was as a student in his Russian course that I first got to know Alan. And I know at this point, you know, as more time goes by, there are fewer and fewer of us left who were in Alan, any of Alan's classes. But those of us who were, I know, always remember things like the fact that Samuel Johnson defined a course as a main quadruped, or that Alan uh, advised any of us who, you know, at a party or a family reunion or whatever, if people asked us what we were studying in graduate school, he said our answer should be, I'm studying to take the geographic controls. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he really, he was just such a, a unique and interesting person. Um, and I think what is a real testament to Alan's legacy is the fact that there's actually a wiki that you can Google and find around the web a wiki of Alan Smith's quotes and um, quotes and notes, basically, that students have contributed to over the years. And uh, you know, I, every time I am lucky enough to host one of these events, I read some of those quotes again. And what I'm always struck with is that Alan really emphasized for us that librarianship is about intellectual curiosity and lifelong learning. And uh, he would always remind us, for instance, that one of his quotes was, librarianship is the field where anything you know will only help you in your work. Anything. Now, granted, sometimes I use that as an excuse to watch an entire season <laughs> of, I don't know, Game of Thrones in one weekend, because it will help you in my work. Um, <laughs> That's true. But, <laughs> <laughs> but he really would. He would say, anything that you know counts in librarianship. And I really think that's true. But what was more important is he really understood the importance of service to our profession. So another one of his quotes was that the best training for any reference librarian would be to go and work as a sausage vendor at Fenway Park so you could learn how to deal with people. He said, I truly believe that, and I truly believe it as well. Um, and one last thing is that I think Alan really modeled for us, and he just so fully embodied with someone who enjoyed. He enjoyed his work, and he enjoyed the process of what librarianship is. So I want to leave you with one last quote from him, which is that in reference librarianship, the answer is inconsequential. It's how we go about finding the answer. And I think that that really sums up who he was. So again, I really want to thank Alan for this legacy that he's left us. And I'm really proud to be able to move from there to introduce today's panel um, and our discussion on Cybercraft. So supporting intellectual freedom and privacy and confidentiality have always been important in administration professions. And in fact, those values are enshrined in the codes of ethics for both ALA and SAA. Um, and, and, but our field, like all fields, has really been impacted both by the explosive growth of technology and social media and by our increased understanding about how our online behaviors are being surveilled and tracked. Um, Librarians and archives facilitate access to information and give us technology that's increasingly necessary for us to get access to information. And we stand in the forefront of many of the challenges that that has posed. So librarians, as many of you probably know, but maybe remember, librarians were some of the first and loudest voices to challenge the Patriot Act. So much so, in fact, that we got the attention of John Ashcroft who called us hysterical and said that the government does, didn't care what Tom Clancy novel anybody was reading. <laughs> but of course, the interesting thing is we found out later that that wasn't really true, right? And it was actually a group of um, four librarians from Connecticut with help from the ACLU that were able to challenge 
the national security letter portion of the Patriot Act and to kind of – to bring some more attention to the seriousness of this act. And there were also librarians who were able to – in fact, one of our panelists was – there was people who helped initiate this way of working around the gag order of the Patriot Act. So the way the Patriot Act is written, if law enforcement comes in and demands case and records, we can't talk about it. We can't tell anybody that this has happened. Except your lawyer. Right. So what some libraries started doing was posting signs that said, the FBI does not visit this library today. Please watch closely for the removal of this sign, which is a way to subtly and without breaking any laws let people know whether or not there had been a visit. So those are a couple of older examples. More recently, there was a library in Lebanon, New Hampshire, which is the first in the country to give its patrons access to these secure Tor browsers so that they could have real anonymity and privacy when browsing on the web. So all of these are great ways that libraries in our country have started to deal with and challenge some of these issues. But we also know that we continue to face challenges. And some of these include things like just recognizing that it's difficult for us as information professionals. We have to figure out how do we balance intellectual freedom and privacy and confidentiality with things like broader issues of safety. And what steps can we take to ensure that our own and our patrons' data is being kept secure? So these are some of the questions that we're going to hopefully tackle today. So with that, it is with great pleasure that I introduce our panel. I want to kind of do this in some sort of order here. So we have Desmond Lex, who is a noted technologist and librarian, and he maintains the blog librarian.net, which if you are not familiar with, I strongly encourage you to check it out. Next to her is Paige Coffers, who is the director of the Technology for Literacy Liberty Program at the ACLU and is also an active board member for the Libraries for Freedom Project. Callum Vignoli is a sports alum and technology director at the Brookline Public Library. And Matt Van Fleet is also a sports alum, and he's the data reference librarian and research and instruction coordinator at Bentley Library. And convening this group is this year's Alan Smith Scholar, Curtis Lane. Fred is a writer, attorney, and an expert witness with expertise in the areas of intellectual freedom, privacy, and cybersecurity, obviously as I was getting asked for our discussion today. And his Cyber Chops book series has identified and outlined many of the pitfalls, some of the most pressing pitfalls that technology and social media opens to us, especially for parents, children, and educators. And that series was a big part of the catalyst for my getting to know Fred and for initiating this visit in this panel today. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Laura. I would like to extend my warmest thanks to Laura and the entire human community for giving me a chance to come down and serve in this capacity this year. I had the pleasure of doing a class last week with one of the alums of that here on cybersecurity and cyber traps for librarians. And I will say personally that it has been enormously inspiring to listen to the students talk about their work as librarians and how meaningful all of these issues are. So it's ultimately, I think, a really great tribute to Alan Smith, and I'm glad to be a part of it. So what we're going to do today is to ask these panelists to address various aspects of the topic of cyber traps for librarians. I'm going to go in the same order that Laura did and ask you to introduce yourselves. And then we'll open the floor to have each of you present for a few minutes on the topics we've discussed. And then we'll go from there. So Jessamyn. Great. So introduce all the way through and then come on back and start again. Great. My name is Jessamyn West. I'm a librarian who went to the University of Washington back when we got masters in librarianships. So I have an MLib in the 1990s. And I started doing librarianship right kind of when the graphical web hit. So I grew up kind of knowing about computers. And I didn't really think when I started going, sorry. Can you guys still, can you hear me without the microphone? OK. And it really turned out that the overlap of computers and librarianship was bigger than I had expected. And so right now, I live in rural Vermont, right in the center in a town called Randolph. And I don't work in my local library. But I do a lot of library activism, both online and in person. And most recently, I've been 
kind of going around Vermont giving a talk that's uh, basically called sort of privacy for librarians and a meta talk at library conferences, which is about how librarians can teach their patrons about privacy, which is partly what I'm going to be talking about today. Cool. I'm, well, I just really don't, I'm going to turn this off. If anybody can't hear, just, yeah, you can hear me, right? Okay. Um, my name is Kate Crockford. I work at the American Civil Liberties Union here in Boston. Um, I run a program called the Technology for Liberty Program. We do two main things. Mostly it's trying to update the law to reflect the new types of technologies that we use to ensure that government is not um, inappropriately tracking us. Uh, the other thing that we do is to try to use technology to advance civil rights and civil liberties. Um, I was involved with Allison Macrina in setting up the Library Freedom Project, which does very similar work to what Jessalyn was just describing. Um, and I have no experience as a librarian, but I have a lot as a reader <laughs> and someone who cares very much about information security. So, so I'm Callan Bignoli. I am the assistant director slash director of technology at the public libraries of Brookline. Um, I did go to Simmons. I graduated at the end of 2011. I didn't get to take a class with Laura, which was really sad, but I did it in the, I did it in a year, so I was a little limited in what my choices were. Um, so before I worked for the Public Libraries of Brookline, it is the Public Library of Brookline, by the way, it's not the, the Brookline Public Library. So that's because we needed to delineate ourselves from the other BPL in town. Because we're special too, so we're the plob. <laughs> we're the plob. So before I got to the PLOB, I was at another acronym, uh, the MBLC, the Mass Board of Library Commissioners, which if you have ever looked for jobs on that site, you probably know to some degree what that is. So it's the state library agency that mostly serves public librarians in the Commonwealth. Um, I also serve on the Board of Friends of the Somerville Public Library. I lived in Somerville for a long time before I took my job in Brookline, um, but that 90 minute commute unfortunately put the end of my Somerville life and you know, made that into an end. Um, so, I, I, in my day to day, I, I manage the technology at our three libraries, um, and I also, you know, both help staff with various troubleshooting that comes up, and all manners of ways. So not only for their their staff computers that they use to do circulation and reference work and collection development work, but also I help uh, with public computers and supporting those, and I partner with the Minuteman Library Network, which we're a part of and our town IT department to make sure everything runs smoothly. So uh, I've long since been interested in the topic of privacy and security in libraries and what we can do to educate patrons in a way that is comfortable and not intimidating to them. So I know that Jasmine, I, she and I, I think have a pretty similar perspective on this. It's, it's very, it can be really daunting to teach people technology in the first place and then to kind of dial it back and tell them they're doing things wrong or that they need to do something <laughs> differently or they need to do something more is, is a lot, it's a tall order. So the other thing I wanna mention in the intro is that I've been a little alarmed at how some of my colleagues are reacting to certain decisions that are being made about um, patron privacy and information sharing, particularly as it uh, concerns younger patrons under the age of 18. And I think that we could all use in public librarianship, at least at within the network that I work in, we really need a values refresher to remind ourselves both the legal reasons why we don't just throw things out for consumption wherever, but also um, the ethical reasons and why we should be standing up for that. Matt. Uh, my name is Matt Van Sleet. I am a um, research instruction coordinator at Benton University in Waltham. It's a business school. Um, my primary kind of interpretation of this uh, subject matter for this panel discussion today is technology related to instruction and particularly in manner of copyright and how we, there are cyber traps involved with copyright as far as you know the, the more increase in demand for online free available material leads to traps and copyright infringement. And so I, today, today we'll be discussing my role as the reluctant copyright guru and how um, this is often the purview of librarians. It's kind of dumped in their lap. And so how I um, approached it and how I worked to solve it and change the culture of the university to not only comply with copyright um, standards and law, but also begin to start pushing back on old assumptions on copyright 
Um, there is a big movement now for a kind of reclaiming of copyright among librarians and scholars and to push back and, and use co and fair use in particular as a muscle and as a kind of a, a, a way to kind of reclaim the rights of educators and scholars to use copyrighted material in a way that's still within the law, but kind of maybe pushing the boundaries a bit. So that's what I'll be discussing today. That's excellent. Um, just a little bit of background. To, um, it's, it's fair to announce that uh, Matt is my brother-in-law. And, so, <laughs> and so we, we've had numerous conversations about his topic. Um, and actually was thinking about this, and I realized that you deserve a certain amount of credit for helping to spawn the Cyber Trap for Librarians idea. Because some of your experiences as the night librarian at MIT mm -hmm. got me thinking about some of the um, Cyber Trap type issues that arise, um, which you can discuss or not as you see fit. Uh, we do have, obviously, a, a terrific panel of people here, so I do want to encourage people, if you have any questions, as we're going through this portion of the presentation, feel free to throw up a hand and, and ask, because I think that's a great way to encourage dialogue. Um, and the same obviously goes for the panelists. If you hear something that someone else is saying, dive in and, and we'll try and facilitate that. Uh, this is now 4.30. They're going to go for about 45 minutes or so. Um, 4.30? The, what's that? <laughs> Sorry, I am so tired. It's 2.30. Oh, when that clock says 1.30, so I'm <laughs> waiting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, um, if we can get our chronological act together, um, the last uh, 40 minutes or so, I've got a PowerPoint presentation, which is a distillation of a lot of the themes that we talked about in the class last week that really go at this issue of cyber traps for librarians. And it will be a great opportunity to have the panelists weigh in and hopefully give you new ideas to research and go forth with. So. With that being said, I'm going to turn this back over to Jessica and have you launch. Great. Um, this is a little bit just talking about the main thing that I talk about that I think is different from what other people talk about, because listening to what you said, like, oh, I'm into the law, I'm into public library technology, I'm really into copyright stuff. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that makes what I do a little bit different, not in a ooh, special way, but just in a it's different way, is that I live in a really small town in Vermont, well, really small, but like 4,500 people. And one of the things that I do every week and what I consider my job, even though it's literally only a couple of hours, but it kind of informs a lot of the other work that I do, the writing, the speaking, the uh, other stuff, is um, I do a thing that's called drop-in time, which is basically com community-oriented technology advice for anyone for free. And you would think I would do it through the library. Um, and my library in town is amazing, but I don't work there. Um, there's like three ladies that work there and they're amazing, but they don't have a huge budget and they do the best that they can. They do a lot of public access. We've got a 100 gigabit connection, which I can't even get my head around. So I bring my laptop there when I have to upload a, a video on the internet, because if I do it at home, it takes an hour. But the drop-in time is just literally like hang out in a room, anybody in the community who has a technology question can come and ask that question and we'll work on it. And sometimes, you know, I have to refer them to the people you pay money for to fix the computer, right? Or sometimes I have to tell them like, the reason this doesn't work is because your computer is 13 years old <laughs> and I'm not judging, but that's a problem for reasons. And part of what I do that's the really librarian angle as opposed to the sort of computer angle is I'm friendly and I'm approachable and I don't tell people to the extent that I can that what they're doing is wrong, even though between you and me, most of the time it is terribly wrong. But it's, <laughs> but it's completely understandable considering how they learn technology and considering where they get their information from. The technology landscape in America, but kind of the world, is, um, kind of a, a landscape of the sort of economic forces where we find ourselves and most of the information that you get about technology is either like from your friends and like what we learned in library school is like you, when you have your information need, you go to the person you're the most comfortable with, not the person with the best information. So people get information from their friends or 
the world of television and newspapers and other sort of uh, people trying to sell you solutions to your problems. And again, nothing wrong with that. Like money is real and you should use it if it helps solve a problem. But it may be that the problem you're having can either have an expensive, irritating solution or a DIY thing you could do if you can follow some steps. Not if you're genius about computers, but just if you can follow some steps but this information is harder to get than the I just want to buy something information. So I've spent a lot of time talking to people about what their real concerns are and learning what they do and do not know about privacy, about their own computers, about their technological environment, about how they learn things. And that informs everything else that they do that involves their technology in their life. It involves how they interact with people on their phone. It involves how they email people at work. It involves, you know, how they plan events. It involves whatever the things are. And each of those subtly trickles down to become kind of what we know of as culture. So I just wanted to share two kind of anecdotes from email and then kind of talk to you about um, five minutes of uh, my privacy talk. But so this morning, two different emails this morning, uh, one of whom is very interesting hearing the copyright thing because I used to work for the Internet Archive. Notable bandits, basically. Lovely people, but their whole deal is making as much as they can freely available and hoping that people won't tell them to stop, even though a lot of what they do involves the C word that we literally weren't allowed to talk about, which is copyright, right? That a lot of what they do is outside of copyright between you and me, and they're waiting for, you know, they're not asking permission, they're asking forgiveness, I guess, if somebody catches them, which people don't. But it's a thing, right? And it's kind of good and kind of not good, but whatever, I don't work there anymore. Um, but I got an email from somebody this morning who was an author who had a book that had been scanned by the Internet Archive that had been put on to open library, completely not asking any permission from anybody. Like this isn't just like, oh, the author's union says one thing, but the author says something different. This is like nobody agreed to anything and their book is just there and you can just have it. Makes people feel bad, right? Um, or could, might. This person was very angry <laughs> and very angry with me personally as the only person who had an email address that was accessible on that website. And I got a long lecture about how they could not feed their children because the Brewster is a monster. And <laughs> I was just like, hey, totally feel you. I don't work there because of a values you know, schism between the people that work there, even though I am one of those like, well, probably everything should be free, but whatever. But their specific issue had to do with what they perceived of as their rights copyright and their understanding of it, which wasn't wrong, um, the Internet Archive and how they perceived how they wanted the future to be. And that's an important part because I think a lot of us are only working on, you know, our own little part of the future and what we hope we can influence for other people. And the only person who is accessible to talk to because the Internet Archive doesn't answer their mail, which was me, right? So that's one story. The other story was we have a local paper in my town and the local guy who writes for the paper, who I met in the coffee shop in town, because there's one coffee shop and one newspaper and one guy, had my email address and dropped me a message because somebody who worked for, I think, VTC, which is our little community college in town, had received an email with an attachment that looked like it was from DocuSign. You know, like you get a thing and you click it and it's very complicated, but you kind of electronically sign your name. I've done it a lot, but if you're somebody who's working at VTC, maybe you've never done it, right? And it turned out, long story short, it was not from DocuSign and it, I don't know what happened. Infected something and it was a problem, but the reporter called me to say, how can we help people not do this? And the answer, which is kind of what I really do for work most of the time, has to do with helping people understand the technology landscape almost more than understanding the technology, right? Because you guys probably all use email and you know the first question is like, well, what email program did they use? Because that's going to affect the flow chart of helping that specific person and that might not help another person who has a different email program. And so you have to teach kind of heuristics 
of sensible technology use, when you're dealing with people, a lot of times you kind of aren't used to the metaphorical idea of they just want like click this, check this, click this other thing, don't click that. And it's easy enough to be like, hey, don't open an attachment if you don't know the person who sent it to you. But it's pretty difficult if you're a person who works in a job at someone somewhere like VCC and every dip is sending you attachments because that's how they communicate with one another because maybe they're not the savviest tech users either. And so in a, in a perfect world with perfect technology use, everybody would be explaining why they sent a thing. You'd be expecting the attachment that you got. You would know the difference between a real and a fake Google document, or at least you could Google for the error message, or is this a scam, or maybe you read Twitter before you checked your email and you know that three of your friends got a virus this morning and you could skip it, but we don't live in a perfect world. And so part of what my librarianship background helps me do with the people at Drop In Time and talking to the people who look at the people in Drop In Time, they're like, what is wrong with these people? I'm like, what's wrong with them is they're humans. What's wrong with them is it's really hard to get information about something where somebody could sell you a solution as opposed to DIYing your solution. And what's wrong with them is the people they talk to about technology often, no offense to anybody in this room, are rude and didactic about the perfect password or the perfect email program or the perfect, you know, you tell someone you got some kind of virus-ish problem and you're using AOL and people almost act like you deserved it. And that's rude because that person is dealing with a problem at this point in their life. They don't need to hear that they should have done something different. And so what I've been doing lately is going on the road in Vermont with a little kind of five slide talk where we just put up a slide, I have like three or four things I talk about, and we have community conversations about privacy, about basic things like passwords. Well, first we start with threat model. Like, because really it's different worrying about your privacy if you're a lawyer or a doctor and you have to, you have laws that prevent you from losing stuff that belongs to other people. Um, and maybe you're an activist and you have to worry a little bit more or a little less, or maybe you're just me sitting at home with my door unlocked in my house in Vermont right now. Kind of don't care, but I use two-factor authentication on my email because I communicate with other people who aren't me. So nobody tweets at us. I tweet whatever you want. I don't even, I'm at Jessamine on Twitter. I got no. <laughs> Go try it. I mean, that's the thing. My phone number is on the internet and I'm female and it doesn't matter. Like most of the time, people's risk assessment and what might happen is different from their feeling of how bad that would be, right? Like I get maybe a creep calling me on the internet maybe once a year, but I get lots of people calling me to offer me work or who are friendly or who have a question. Risk reward totally works for me. Might not for you, but like that's okay. So we talk about threat model, we talk about passwords, how you make a good one, what other people use, What's better? Um, we talk about the Internet of Things and how your TV can't spy on you if it's not connected to the Internet, which seems like kind of a duh thing, but for a lot of people, they read in the newspaper, Internet of Things, TV spies on me, don't quite get the whole thing, and they would like someone friendly to explain it to them, and that's me. We talk about spying and tracking generally. I had a big thing when I went to the library in, uh, I think, Sudbury? which has like a big camera sign, like you are being watched in the library, right above the sign that says, everyone is welcome at the library. But like to me, who's like a, you know, kind of activist person, those things don't go together. To a lot of people, especially a lot of young women in audiences that I've spoken to, the cameras make them feel more secure because they feel like it's putting creeps on notice so they can walk around in the hallways. Never would have thought of that. And we talk about the idea of perfect privacy, which is a thing you can't have. Sorry. Um, I mean, you know, I read spy novels at night just to like think of the ways things can terribly go wrong even when you fix everything. And trying to tell people how to be safer using things like EFF's privacy badger, the best, like ad blocker, totally works, ghostery, cool, browsing plugins, actually pretty simple to use if clicking is something you can do. 
and then we have a chat about it, and the things people get are they feel a little bit better about their own choices, they feel a little bit better that these things are difficult for everybody, they're just maybe difficult along different axes, and they feel a little bit better that if they really had a question, they could ask somebody who cares, like me, or their librarian, not somebody who doesn't care, like Google, who is trying to tell you something. Excellent. Any questions? Anybody would like to ask any of the little things? Just I have to confess, I'm an avid Internet Archive user. So, so, so am I, but they are thieves. <laughs> so I actually have a question. <laughs> so, Talent. Yes. <laughs> so what, during drop-in drop time, do you give them this instruction about what you just mentioned as part of that, no matter what? Or do no. they ask you about it? Or how does that happen? I usually mention that having better passwords is a good idea. We talk a little bit about it. But I definitely don't get all up in people's business right. if they don't seem to care. Yeah. One of the things that's the hardest about privacy and librarianship is we care more about privacy than most of yeah. our patrons, sure. which I still think is important. But I try not to proselytize just because proselytizing is rude. and because that's not what they ask about. Yeah. And part of what you need to do is kind of be just-in-time information, but mm -hmm. once they have a pa question about passwords or about something else, they know they can come to me. The biggest sure. advice that I give that makes people be like, oh, this is a lot, is just telling them to write stuff down. Yeah. And it's awkward, because I know that's not the best, but realistically speaking, you're more at risk of forgetting your Apple ID, which every single human being in my town does, than you are at having somebody break into your house, get your Apple ID, and then see how you forget. Scared away your memory? Yeah, I'm going to try to make a case for proselytizing. All right. Um, <laughs> yes. So. And I'm super shy, too, so that's part of it. Yeah. I'm looking forward to um, it. <laughs> I think it is your job to proselytize about information security and privacy. Um, you know, as you said in the introduction, the Patriot Act was a really uh, scary moment that we still haven't passed out of, frankly. Um, this country is still living in the post 9-11 mindset that says there's pretty much nothing the government can do to invade our privacy that isn't justifiable on the basis of some security need. Um, I think that libraries as one of the very few among the vanishing um, truly open public spaces that exist in the United States today because of that and because librarians, as you said, really do, because of your profession, understand that information is power and that privacy is a threshold requirement in order to achieve intellectual freedom, which is something that librarians hold dear. That because of those things, the fact that libraries are one of the few vanishing public spaces and because information security and privacy are core values of libraries, that it actually is a really valuable and important role for librarians to play politically to push back against the idea that the NSA has a right to wiretap or eavesdrop on all of our communications about warrants, that a local police department has a right to put license plate readers all over the town and track where people are driving, without even so much as getting authorization from the city council or discussing the issue um, with the public, let alone getting any democratic approval or oversight or things like that, that um, you're in a really unique and I think in some ways powerful position because people trust librarians. Um, people see you, I think, in some ways as neutral actors um, who are helpful, right? And. Um, I think it's really unfortunate and dangerous that during the Obama administration especially, we didn't see a real swing back from the Bush era um, mentality that this country was so deeply steeped in during those eight years that said, again, there's really nothing the government can do that's too much, right? Um, and we have to. I mean, it's, it's very clear, I think, to many people in this country now why that was dangerous. The, uh, you know, Democrats kind of coming to terms with and normalizing a lot of the worst excesses of the Bush administration. The ACLU, 
um, we saw a real dip in our membership and our donors during those eight years of the Obama administration. And part of the reason for that, I think, is because a lot of progressives and liberals who are the bulk of our donors and our members thought that things were fine. <laughs> That's funny, isn't it, now? Um, <laughs> And that's one of the reasons why the ACLU and I think probably librarians too as a profession believe in principles, right? We have values. It's not about whatever party's in charge. We don't frankly care who the president is. We care about uh, respect for basic rights and norms and values like privacy, intellectual freedom, due process, things like that. Um, and so anyway, we can see I think the danger of, uh, the danger of you know, sort of ignoring those values. Um, I just want to say too that I think I'm really interested in the work that you're doing because I had a conversation a couple nights ago with some folks at MIT who are really highly technical people who are working on some ways to try to figure out, for example, how to draw, uh, bring some transparency to problems like false news. I was required by one of these research scientists to never say the term fake news. He thinks that's an, a Trump propaganda thing, so I'm gonna call it false news. That's what he asked me to do, maybe you should do it too. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, you know, these folks are working on really complicated problems trying to understand the way that artificial intelligence and machine learning and algorithmic uh, decision making automation are impacting society, trying to understand the ways that you know, Facebook and Twitter are manipulated and the way that that impacts public discourse. We were having a really high level conversation in that room. Um, it's a conversation that probably a lot of folks who come talk to you would, would not understand at all. They don't know what Twitter is. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I guess this is where I think you all can play a real role, both in educating and to some de degree in proselytizing to the public about the, the value and the necessity, frankly, of coming to terms in a much more general way with issues like automation and artificial intelligence and machine learning and the impact that those things are having on people's access to information, their ability to even understand the, the options that are laid out to them when they log on to the computer and they see the news in front of them in the morning. Um, I think a lot of people don't understand that that's not a neutral list of um, news items. It's not like picking up the New York Times, a paper copy that has the same news outlet for every single person who reads the newspaper. As you know, when you go online now, you see something that is an of oftentimes radically different from what other people are seeing. Um, these are important things to talk about with the general public. They are not things that should be left to the domain of experts at MIT or to people like me who work in civil rights and civil liberties trying to ensure that the new technological developments don't outpace our rights. These are things that everybody needs everybody needs to know about. Um, so I would just you know, put in a plug for some education at your libraries about issues like that. Certainly about privacy and information security, but also about issues that are more cutting edge and have to do with, again, the, the way that people's choices and access to information are in increasingly constrained or you know, their our field of view is shrunk, limited, narrowed by corporations that are using algorithms that those corporations don't even understand. Um, Facebook and Google don't understand how their algorithms work. They're way too complicated. Yeah. I mean, that was clear when, when um, Facebook initially said, no, 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 uh, Russia wasn't doing anything on Facebook. That was their first response. And then they said, okay, we looked a little bit closer and we found that in fact Russia was doing some things on it Facebook. They were totally doing things. But we don't totally understand what happened uh, because our algorithms are very complex. Um, so that's something that people need to know. People, because everyone uses these technologies. And you know, it's different from back in the day when people would say, oh, you should know how to change your oil. Yeah, okay, that's fine. You know, if you drive, you maybe want to understand how a car works. It is much more important in the 21st century than it was in the, in the 20th to understand how a car works, to understand now how information travels, how it is used as a commodity, and how big corporations like Google and Facebook are again limiting our field of view. Um, I think it's also understand, it's important for people to understand that I think not only because it's a problem, but, but because we have to do something about it, right? And an uninformed citizenry is totally ill-equipped to do what we need to do, which is 
at the very basic level, implement privacy law to catch up with the technologies we've been using for 20 years, not a smartphone, but a cell phone. Um, we here in Massachusetts right now do not have a statute requiring law enforcement to get a warrant to track our phones. This is, I mean, it's, it's really basic. That's like baby steps stuff. You know, we're talking about machine learning and algorithmic decision making <laughs> and automation and we don't even have the most basic constitutional protections in many states um, applied to technologies, again, we've been using for two or three decades now. That type of informed approach is necessary in order to get legislatures to deal with these problems. It's also necessary in order to get legislatures to deal with the types of problems that Europe is, frankly, smashing at with things like the general data protection regulations. Do folks, are folks in here familiar with the GDPR at all? So these are um, data protection regulations that the EU just formalized. They're really great. They um, hold companies like Google and Facebook uh, to basic fair information practices. They also, though, grant European citizens the right, for example, to access information about how decisions are made about them, even when those decisions are automated. So if they're denied, if a European citizen is denied a loan, that person can go to the credit agency or the bank and say, I want to not only see the algorithm, if they can possibly understand that, but I want you to explain to me in language that I can understand how you reach this decision. That is a really important way of thinking about information and democracy in the 21st century. And it's something that we in the United States are not remotely close to, to doing. Um, Companies like Google and Facebook are totally unregulated. Obviously, just this week, uh, you know, Congress is trying to deregulate the finance industry again. Um, so we're moving in the wrong direction, and, and in order for that to change, we need people to be informed about what's happening and what's happening to them. Um, I was gonna say a lot of other things, but I'll just wrap up by saying that um, I think there are, there are a number of things that librarians can do at a very local level, um, insofar as educating yourselves and your employees and your colleagues about your rights and responsibilities uh, under the law as a librarian to your patrons and their private information. And we actually have a fact sheet on my website that describes some of those rights and responsibilities for Massachusetts librarians. You can access that at privacysos slash libraries. Um, and then I would just say that you know, when it comes to things like surveillance cameras, I'm really interested by what you said because I often hear that too. Law enforcement officials will say to me all the time, you don't understand, people want surveillance cameras I was because it makes them feel safe. It doesn't actually make us safe <laughs> though, right? Um, the most heavily surveilled city on earth is London, England. In London there are tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of surveillance cameras run by the police. The uh, Home Office in England did a study a few years back to determine whether or not those cameras were actually advancing public safety. And what they found is that for every 1,000 cameras, well, let me just back up for a second. People often think that cameras deter crime, they don't. There have been a number of studies that show that cameras deter vandalism, petty vandalism in things like car parks. They do not deter rape, they do not deter assault, they do not deter murder, they certainly do not deter terrorist attacks um, or other serious violence. Basically, they stop people from writing on the walls. So if that's what you're worried about, okay. Um, but then people often say, well, they help us identify who committed a crime after the fact. In London, the most heavily surveilled city on earth, British Home Office did a study finding that for every 1,000 surveillance cameras on the street of London, they solved one crime per year for 1,000 cameras. So the facts do not support the conclusion that cameras actually protect public safety. I think that is another area where, you know, as folks who intrin intrinsically understand the value of information and privacy, um, maybe you can, you know, push back when your librarian or your, you know, town police chief says, okay, we're going to install 20 cameras at, on, at the library. Why? 
they're dealing with that empathy, right? Yeah. Well, never. Why, why do you want to do that? I, I mean, I think, you know, when you ask questions of um, the knee-jerk impulse to surveil, collect more information, you know, make it more accessible to more people, and you really drill down, do you have any evidence to show that this will actually improve public safety? Do you have any evidence to show that you know, the one, two, three reasons you are invoking for the deployment of this type of surveillance, that it will actually achieve any of those goals? We actually have to start asking those questions, I think. Well, and it raises an interesting point, too, because with the improvements in camera technology, if you're installing cameras in the library, your capacity to see what someone is actually reading is really right. enhanced, yeah. and, and it's really not that hard to do. And with facial recognition technology, we deal with that in Vermont now. The, the DMV has been using that to track people, even though we have laws on the books that say you're not allowed to, and there's a big fight about what, what you can and can't do with that technology. Absolutely. Any questions uh, here? So step forward and away from this topic of yes. libraries role yeah. educating the communities um, in the class that we had on this topic last week, there was a lot of tension and terse discussion <laughs> around librarians as educators, uh -huh. and are they, and do they want to be? Some of them do, some of them do not. There was also a lot of discussion, um, and you know, personally I was sad and a little frustrated to hear about what it's like to be, especially in a public library, on the Every day, where people are asking you the same question 75 times a day, and you are kind of like seething inside because you answered it, hopefully, kindly 74 other times. But the frustration was really around the fact that there are ways to provide information to patrons, all kinds of ways, print and online, where that recitation, you know, could still happen in a personal way, but be a little bit more meaningful for both of those parties. So one thing that we talked a little bit about that everyone was just like, that will never happen, is um, librarians as content creators. And uh, I think it's a funny thing that I don't yet understand because I don't work in a library. Uh, why people will spend a lot of their work and personal time to prepare things like events and talks that are live, but not feel like it is worth their time to create content that can live digitally in the library's website or channels to do just this thing. And I think it's a disconnect, and I think largely has to do with the amount of time that they have in the day and the number of jobs they're all doing. Yeah. Uh, but I think the question it raises for me is in library school, are we equipping people uh, to think about the profession in a way that allows the people who do have interest in doing this kind of public education to do it? And I, I'm not sure. Interesting question. Yes, sir. You wanna? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, just briefly check up on the, the logic of the of installing surveillance in libraries. Have any of the libraries that are now doing that or talking about doing it had a spike of in library crime that that might have been used just as justification, just out of the blue? You know, my, what I've heard, and maybe other folks have different um, views on this, but what I've heard is that there are pro there's, there are some problems, for example, with um, people shooting up in bathrooms or, um, you know, certain people feeling unsafe because there's this one guy who sometimes comes in and looks at porn and jerks off in the corner, you know, like, things like that. I, I haven't heard any librarian say, you know, we're afraid of, God forbid, something like what happened in Lexington, you know, last week or two weeks ago happening, obviously freak random acts of violence or something that no camera is going to stop. Anyway, um, but I haven't heard that it's anything serious like that. It's more like kind of That's quality of life true. stuff. Yeah. yeah so for you? us at Brookline, this happened right before I got there, so I wasn't involved in the decision making process, but we had about $6,000 of video games stolen from us uh, in the fall of 2016. 
and immediately after the director installed this surveillance camera, well, sort of as an immediate response to that. Event. With certain collections like DVDs or video games, I can understand, or like rare books. But yeah. You know, if it's like isolated to the section, it's just because those are expensive assets. Right. That's exactly sell. how it is right. for us. Yeah, so that makes we, some we sense. We have three yeah. buildings, yeah. and there's 20 cameras, and they're not everywhere. They're not in reading spaces. Right. They're not in places right. where you can really get a high fidelity shot of what anyone is looking at. Although I will say, if you go and watch the video feed, it's frightening how clear and crisp. The, the images. Right. Yeah. And a, a Quincy that's looking into it, and Brian, aren't you on that? Weren't you on that task force or whatever? Yeah. Um, one of the reasons they're looking at it is they were getting theft, not like people stealing things from the library, but people kind of bending the rules about being like a new patron at the library and then checking out whatever a thousand dollars worth of material and then you know absconding with it and and so it really wasn't that they thought they could prevent it but they thought through information sharing which raises yeah, its own right. privacy yeah. issues that they're taking very seriously they could at least tell other libraries hey if this person tries to show up with their three kids mm -hmm. check out a thousand dollars worth of stuff not let them but it's awkward right because right. Sure. that's not a great idea ratting out people to other libraries isn't a great idea it's yeah. the community's content that you're charged with preventing, but having policies that are more restrictive on new patrons is its own. I mean, it's just twiddling knobs to try and sure. figure it out. I mean, the thing I'm gratified by is that they're taking it super seriously. Yeah, so I was I worked for the state at the time. Well, that, were you on the task force for the patron information sharing? Is that no, what you were talking about? Or something else? Just it's something else. Okay. Yeah. So the related, but not. Yeah. yeah. Do you know about this? Mm -hmm. It was like so the Mass Library System and a bunch of other library and public librarians at big urban libraries in the state convened a task force on patron information sharing, which is I think that of, was the one that yeah. Yeah. So it was basically exactly what you're talking about. So the idea was to create sort of a criminal database. Honestly, there's no <laughs> other <laughs> there's no other way to put it of problem patrons. So that we could all log in there and file our incident reports about this or that person who did this or that thing that we didn't like. And there was no conversation, no discussion wow. over how that was going to work, how people's biases were going to play into that, what members of staff would have access to it, like what would happen if those people stopped being librarians and they left the field and like they took that record about that person along with them in some capacity. It was really bad. Did and that so, happen? No, no, it did not. <laughs> the state, so when I worked with the state, my boss and I were just like, uh-uh, like this is not only illegal, but it's also disgusting that like you would even want this thing to exist. Yeah, if I could just, I mean, like one thing that I always think about when we talk about doing things like that or, you know, installing cameras because people are stealing videotapes or whatever, it's like, what would we do in the pre-digital era right. it's fishing to address it. this problem, you know? Like, why don't we take a step back yeah. and think about other ways that we could address problems like yeah. this? Right. Because maybe if we think creatively, there are other things we could be doing. Like, I just spoke to reporters at NPR a few days ago about the use of social media surveillance systems by schools that are saying, you know, we want to monitor the, the ways that our students are talking on the internet when they're at home, um, partially because we're, we're concerned about youth who are suicidal and we want to be able to intervene, right? And it's like, okay, one approach to, that, to the problem of youth suicide and depression could be that you spy on all the children. Another approach could be that you have education and you create a culture in the school so that young people feel like they can talk to adults when their friend is you know, talking about killing themselves or whatever, right? So we have this tendency, I think, because a digital technology exists, and as you said, somebody's definitely trying to sell it to you, right? If you work at a library or at a public school Always. system or a police department, there are a lot of people trying to sell you surveillance technology all the time. Mm -hmm. So there's someone who's got you know, slick marketing materials who's like, for 20 grand, I can solve the problem of youth suicides for you. Don't Just, you like children? Right, exactly. Yeah. 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 And the much more holistic and probably successful approach would be to actually just speak to high school students right. about depression and suicide and make guidance counselors available to them and you know yeah, right. we don't we don't often yeah. do those things because they're harder they involve difficult conversations you know people may think that it's politically inappropriate to talk to young people about suicide um, but Anyway, there are other ways to address social and political problems than surveillance. Yeah. Caitlin, why don't you dive in? Well, yeah. oh, just for a quick, some of the things you've mentioned as examples, Kate, have been things that 
if we had funding for other services would not fall upon right. us or upon oh. like surveillance. Right. Yeah. Comes out of that a lot of time. Yeah, funding yeah. Is, is the big, it's not even the political half of time, it's the financial. Right, and Would, we, we have faced that certainly in the post 9 11 climate, where literally billions of dollars have transferred from the federal government to state and local governments for the expansion of a surveillance state at state and local police departments. And one of the things that we would really like to see as we try to change that dynamic going forward is local communities getting together and saying to the federal government, we don't want any more money for surveillance technology. We want money for our schools and our libraries. Stop giving us DHS grants, yes, right? Yeah. We, want, armored cars. Yeah, we want other types of money. And like community driven law enforcement. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, Karen, this, is the, this is the point that have you talked about, because you're obviously in the throes of the technology. To what extent then is technology being used to replace people? you know, in terms of budget priorities. Well, I mean, one thing I just want to mention, too, is just because it's sort of humorous, is that the, the system that the state demoed while they were looking into this information sharing thing was called the Patron Information uh, Tracking System. Pits. So it's PITS, right? <laughs> yeah, it was literally <laughs> PITS. It was not flashy or sexy or attractive at all. It looked like 1995 wanted its angel fire gauge back. It was, it was a dumpster fire. Like, I'm sorry, I have to use that term at every opportunity I have. But it was really bad. And I remember um, one of the people on the test force asked, so if a patron is put in the pits, do they ever get out of it? <laughs> <laughs> they get out of the pits. Which is just, yeah, which is like a, it's silly, but it's a valid question. You know, I think that the way that I try to approach my work is that people have bad days. They're not bad people. And that may not be true 100% of the time, but I would say 99.9% .9 of the time is true. And, you know, we try to give people the benefit of the doubt for a living. I feel like that's my job as a public librarian. The whole premise of my work is based on the fact that I can trust someone to do something in a way that is fair and equitable and sharing with the rest of the community. I needed Facebook about it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So I needed to broaden my horizons and it's really important to have a two-way conversation, right? Because these people, you know, they wanted to pick my brain, but I also wanted to, I did take the opportunity to remind them of my own professional ethics. So when I went down there, many people were surprised to hear I was a librarian, and many people were surprised to know why a librarian decided to come to South by Southwest. And I feel like it's it's obvious why, you know, like we we need to have our, our fingers on the pulse of the conversation that's happening at a larger scale than us, because a lot of that does impact the security. I mean, information as it's obtained and used and collected. Um, I know a lot more scary things that happen at the state level that I talk about at some other point, um, but, you know, there, within libraries and without libraries, uh, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot to be, there's a lot going on, and we should not, we should remember to not just be heads in the sand, library land only type thinking. Mm -hmm. Interesting perspective. Matt. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to switch what I was going to talk about, because I, I think, I see a common theme here. One is education. I think everything that everyone's been talking about today so far really relies on education, getting the word out. Um, and then in my role in, as a instructional librarian at higher ed, now that's a different type of library than the public library, right? But I rely on the ACRL framework for information literacy. And it's designed in a way so that you can embed those skills into the curriculum as you're teaching and working with faculty uh, for library instruction. So it's all about being able to locate information, evaluate it, and use it um, ethically. And, th and that framework is designed, and that's my guiding kind of principles as I begin to design lesson plans to teach students how to use information that they're encountering in their research, but also in their everyday lives. So I kind of see where those skills are they're already being taught in schools. And, I mean, in higher ed, but they can be applied elsewhere. And I think there was a, a few years ago, the uh, person who had my current role invited a bunch of high school librarians over, and they, they had a little discussion, round, round table discussion, about um, why, why students entering higher ed um, are, are coming lacking the essential skills to be able to conduct research. Mm -hmm. they, they lack the ability to effectively navigate databases, 
evaluate sources for quality and bias. Um, and these are all skills that they should be entering college with already at grasp. They should have a kind of baseline knowledge about how to effectively begin doing research, and they're not at that point. So right there, that's an indication that those skills aren't being taught in, in, in school, in high school. Um, also, those skills could be taught to the general public, like Jesmyn's um, roadshow. Like, um, it's all about community partnerships. Or, and and uh, th these are things I'm developing on campus, going to student organizations and student groups, finding opportunities to kind of um, coordinate with them as far as programming, events, workshops, um, basically getting out of the library itself and going to meet the need where they are. They're not going they will only come to you if they really um, are pushed to, so you need to go meet them where they are. Um, and I think that approach can be effective in the public realm. It's just, it has to, and to get to the question about librarians as educators and teachers, Yes, not every library is in effect is comfortable teaching. Well, and not everyone needs to be. Right. Like when I became an academic librarian, I was not a teaching librarian. Um, and it took me a long way to get to that point. The point now I feel comfortable in the classroom, but it took me a long time to get there. And it's not just public speaking skills, it's all about um, being comfortable in, in the information you're trying to convey. Um, it's all about lesson and design and curriculum and involving the curriculum and it's coordinating with faculty. It's a very involved process, um, but there are things you can do to um, still affect change and still convey the skills you need to. For public libraries, you can partner with uh, a neighboring institute of higher education, have them come visit, schedule programming, invite um, the high school librarian into the public library. Um, so there are things you can do to meet those needs um, so that, I guess, and it's all about, it's new things, digital literacy, right? It's, it's knowing how to um, engage effectively and ethically with all the digital environments that you engage in every day and know how to really evaluate the sources um, that you encounter. Evaluate anything with, you know, with the fake news and the alternative facts, whatever you want to call them. Um, it's really all about just um, being able to evaluate that and, and critically think about what you're encountering. So, do you get any pushback on that though? That 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 kind of critical thinking is itself a partisan act. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a second question, but but in the sense that um, I mean, one of the specific to that, one of the arguments that you often here is that, that particularly higher ed is aimed at sort of instilling liberal values. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's a tinge of that. I'm just curious in terms of your interactions with students, if they're pushing back at you. Um, I did have one occasion where, as an example, I, I, um, I have this kind of canned lesson about um, going to popular sources like newspaper articles and magazine articles to find um, and harvest more information, maybe they cite a study, and it, it links to a more scholarly source. So I had a kind of uh, sample New York Times article, and somebody did say something about um, New York Times. Times. You know that. Yes. <laughs> so I do, I, it's not overt, but I do get yeah. sometimes you know, little comments about that. So. I, I would say generally, in my experience, it seemed to be partisan only when it has personal meaning for students. You know, it's something they really care about. It's like a hot topic debate, like if it's about marijuana or somehow it's going to affect their, I'm, just as an example, I'm sure. not, not as a blanket statement, but you know, it's something they really care about. Or even in the way they consume things, too, where they don't want to give any thought to what they're buying necessarily, but just why do we need to give it any thought, just do it kind of thing, you know? My neighbor has the same thing, it's fine. Kind of, kind of thing. That makes sense. Well, the other thing I wanted to follow up with with your piece of this, Matt, is that it, it strikes me that the kind of skills that you're talking about folds into the K-12 curriculum in terms of digital citizenship mm -hmm. as being a necessary component of understanding civil rights, for instance, or our intellectual freedoms. Right. 
Um, and that's where I see it intersecting. I mean, my concern about really just engaging the information um, and knowing how to uh, react to it and interpret it um, could really aligns very closely with the other topics discussed today about uh, privacy and security. So mm -hmm. Interesting. the broader umbrella of digital literacy. Yeah. Cool. All right. What uh, questions do you guys have for the panel? Question for Kate. So, in your view, when is there a legitimate case for security cameras? Mm, I don't know, like at a nuclear reactor. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I mean, if people are watching them, like in cases where you know there's something that you really want to make sure never gets touched or whatever, or if, or if there's some sort of um, you know AI or machine learning that alerts human beings when someone has entered a secure area that you know you don't want. I mean, I really, I really do think that there's sort of limited use case in terms of how they're actually useful for security. Um, but that said, I think that anytime a community or whatever wants to think about adopting a surveillance technology or really any system that implicates people's privacy there's like a three-step process. The first is to ask what problem you're trying to solve, right? What is the actual problem here? Um, and like I said before, see if there's another way of addressing the problem that doesn't implicate people's privacy. And then if there isn't, and you think actually, you know, surveillance cameras is the, is, that's the only tool, that, or that's the only thing we could do, there's nothing else we could do, um, then you have to ask whether the costs outweigh the benefits or vice versa, right? So um, certainly in libraries, generally um, anywhere, there are real privacy issues involved with the cameras. Um, you know, do the costs outweigh the possible benefits as you, you know, figured them out, figured out what the benefits are in step one of the question, of the series of questions. And then third, there has to be I think community discussion about these issues, right? And um, that community discussion should should basically, you know, like you could say to the community, okay, like you know, we we have this problem, whatever the problem is, we thought about ways to address it, we couldn't figure out another way, so we're thinking about security, our surveillance cameras, and you know, we understand that there are privacy risks here, but we think that the the benefits out actually outweigh the costs. What do you think, <laughs> right? Um, does that sound right to you? Uh, as a you know, a public library, we want to make sure that you know we're not doing anything that offends the public. Um, and then if folks say, yeah, actually that makes sense to us. You know, we've heard your arguments about why you think the, the library needs them and what the costs and benefits are, and we agree. Then you have to like think very specifically about what types of cameras, um, like you said, what types of technology will be used on the cameras who has access to the footage, how long it's retained, whether you're going to demand law enforcement gets a warrant to access stored videos. Um, you just have to have, you know, be really clear about exactly what you're doing and promulgate a policy that's public and understand that those images are public records, most likely. So you have to also have a plan for what if someone comes to the library and says, I want all of your stored video footage. That in itself is a security risk. Um, so you know that would have to be a part of the cost-benefit weighing. Um, is it actually safer for people to, you know, be videotaped all the time when they're in the library, including children, and then that information be available to anybody all anywhere in the country who wants to ask for it? Um, so yeah, I, I think there just has to be a lot more deliberation involved than there generally is. Which is generally it's just like someone's like, "There's a problem with crime," and then the people are like, "Oh, great, put some cameras in." Okay, done. Yeah. You know. And like all those steps get skipped. <laughs> well, and if you watch movies like what is it, a National Treasure, you know how easy it is to get around those surveillance. You can also <laughs> hack them. I mean, if they're connected to the internet, well, it could be a security risk, yeah. right? And so the like, whole baby cam thing. Yeah. It's just so, a thing. Don't. Yeah, like I live in a condo building. The people in my building are all the time trying to get these cameras <laughs> that are like hooked up to, you know, Comcast and can, like see when you're at work what what's happening outside. I'm like, no. Don't, we're not doing that. <laughs> that did, is not secure. Has anyone actually had any interest in that? What was it, the Amazon key system? Oh, right, right. You know, basically, <laughs> where the little video camera and the Amazon person can come in and, yeah, anyway. Let's start here and work our way over. Go ahead. 
Yes, that's you. I was thinking that. Um, so, um, how do you educate like um, information professionals about these things? Like, obviously, we're a group of people who um, talk about these things and understand these things. But the situation where there was the um, problem, like the train database that was luckily like shot down, but obviously there were people that were for it because they believed that this would help. How do you go forward to educate information professionals about? the problems that arise from that and to call their own peers and even to call patron peers because patrons could fight back and be like, no, we do need cameras. It's like, no, no. Like, how do you help people understand the situation? I think that so my name's Callum, just saying. Callum, 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 Callum like Callum. It's okay, Callum. it's all right, it's a tough one. Callum like Callender or Vignoli like Vignes is my tough Because that's fun. Well, that um, one's yeah. <laughs> no problem. So, uh, so I think that a big part of it is transparency, right? So, like, who really knows that this went on? You know, the hand, yeah, very few people know that it happened. And, you know, the information is, is publicly posted, it is out there. It's just the word about this never really got out. And, and you know, part of that was just because it was being figured out as opposed to something that was being decided. But, you know, as soon as it got, so, like, it was presented at the Mass Library Association conference back in May. But still, that's a very finite group of people. I think they get like 300 attendees or something like that. And it's a very self-selecting group, and it tends to be the same people all the time. So you know, I think pushing for transparency from the, the state-level organizations when they do these task forces is really important. Um, and so you know, we also, when I was working for the state, worked on a, a project to assess the risks and social login for a replacement of library card login. So to use like Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn to log in instead of Barco, which is an awesome user experience thing, but holy crap. Like there were, I mean, I learned so much from that project that I just never even considered. There's a whole class of companies out there now that acts as the middle ground between the person requesting that social login be implemented and the social media provider. And there's a lot of money to be made there, and it is not in compliance with our laws about future privacy. And you know that Facebook wants to handle book checkouts for you for all kinds of Oh boy. <laughs> well, they can go away. Yes, next, go ahead. <laughs> can I just say something yes, silly? Please, I would yeah. just say that um, one of the things that's important, I think, in this space is to talk to people about these issues before there's a crisis, right? Um, because, like, you know, what just happened in Lexington last week, like, I would not be surprised if people there are like, we need more cameras now, you know, because there was a horrible thing that happened, and people, so we react from our lizard brains, and that's not always rational, you know? Winchester, Winchester right? Sorry, yeah, Winchester, okay. Winchester, yeah, I get those towns. Yeah, they're very similar. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, I was so like, oh, in a second. No, 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 no. Sorry, <laughs> But, yeah, my point is that, you know, creating, that's why I think doing this kind of public education just about why privacy matters when there isn't a crisis, right? This is not a response to 9-11. It's not a response to someone getting murdered in the library. It's just, let's have a conversation about why this is an important value, and then people can be more prepared intellectually when there is a crisis to have a more rational approach to dealing with so it. So one thing I just wanted to say really quickly as a response to that is in the case of Winchester, so there tends to be sort of a group think issue in our profession, sure. at least like certainly within the directors of the Minutemen Library Network. No shade is being thrown, but it does happen. <laughs> and so, you know, I know the director who works in Winchester and I think that she's gonna she's gonna retire justifiably after having went through that. Yeah. I mean, how, who could blame her? Yeah, but I can also see at a network meeting someone saying, well, in response to Winchester, we need to do this and this and this yeah. that actually compromises mm -hmm. privacy. And the whole room of 42 directors being like, yep, you're right, we need to do that. And very few people pushing back on it. And, and then you get into these difficult things where you're thinking, wow, you've got a single incident and the library system is trying to respond. And then you have multiple incidents around the country and nobody's responding. Yeah. So that's our just when you were. Well, I just also wanted to mention it's a really great opportunity for state level library associations, of which we have 50 plus in this country, to be able to proactively communicate. I mean, librarians are on more email lists, I think, than like <laughs> any other human beings on the planet. But, like, you know, Vermont Library Association has an intellectual freedom committee, yeah. and that's actually one of the reasons that the Patriot Act stuff that I did trickled down to these tiny libraries of 500 to 700 people because people read their email and you can literally, I mean, it is kind of why a lot of us like Twitter is you can get these like quick kind of headlines 
hey, notify your Minuteman Library Network Director that you don't yeah. want more cameras in the library, or you do, or whatever. You can at least know that there's a thing, and you can kind of work your way down to it. A library associations or consortiums, depending on the state. We have no right. consortiums in Vermont. But the state library and the state library association don't kind of see themselves, I think because of the advocacy issue, as wanting to be like, here's a thing you can fight about, but realistically understanding that that's coming down the pike. You know, guns in libraries is the thing they're dealing with in Texas, for instance. Sure. People should at least have heard of it before someone from the public comes in and they're like, so, cameras in Winchenden, yes, no, and you're like, oh, I hadn't thought about it. Mm -hmm. And it is a, a, an opportunity at that level, and also for people to plug in and demand this accountability and transparency from their state library associations and their regional consortia. Well, as part of the education and outreach, I think the map is talking about. Exactly. You know, to kind of lay the groundwork for these. Yeah. Well, and you were talking about ACRL. I mean, they do a lot of great, yeah. they, they're really good with that. I feel like better than PLA. PLA is also very good. Yeah. Like some big associations really handle it, and some, some no, are less here. Yeah. Not so much. Please go ahead. Um, we talk all about like kind of access to ID and information, and also like the algorithm controlling what, what we see. Um, we really haven't really talked about the you know the vendors themselves, the people who are providing internet. And so, in the light of the you know, net neutrality and to see the base of a lot of lawsuits, I think that's come in the past a couple of weeks against the FCC and the state have come and said, hey, we're going to have net neutrality in our state. Washington State has done yes. that. Yes, Vermont. Vermont has done so. Um, and so I just was wondering your thoughts kind of based on that, because we talked about the hours, we haven't talked about this new main political body of the net neutrality and how that affects children. Yeah, good question. Who wants to take a step? Please. So in Massachusetts, um, there's legislation to restore net neutrality as well as legislation to reinstate the privacy rules that we've lost um, that applied to ISPs that Obama's FCC had um, implemented. And it would be fantastic if library associations or individual librarians wanted to get involved in the legislative effort here. Um, that's certainly one thing that I hadn't thought of until this moment, but I'm very involved with that work, so if you want to get involved in it, you should let me know. And then, um, also, I, I, I mean, I think it's a similar thing, right? Like, you could have a sign in your library or in, you know, libraries at the front desk that says, you know, what does the end of net neutrality mean for library at the uh, internet at the library. And you could have like a little one pager that people can take that's like, what is net neutrality, right? Does it apply to the library? Yes, it applies to all internet <laughs> right, all over the country. So those types of things, and like you were saying, you don't have to have a talk, right, right or on net neutrality. You this as it relates to what an individual person will need. Do you right. want to pay yeah. more for Netflix? Right. Yes, yeah. no. Yeah. Right. right. You know, right. Oh, we hear all this stuff, and we care about it. Yeah. But the average person is like, yeah, you know, super how do you get in there? Yeah. yeah, totally. And also making the connection. I mean, I think that the Netflix thing is is the thing that people understand the most. I think the thing that people understand the least probably is how important net neutrality is for freedom of information, right? And and as an anti censorship tool. So, yeah, I mean, that would be awesome if libraries were educating their patrons about that and even saying, like, did you know there's legislation at the State House to deal with this? I mean, you don't have to tell people to support it. Obviously, you probably aren't supposed to do that, but you can tell people it exists. I mean, that's not a problem. Yeah, yeah. We, did, we did a thing where we just literally sent a thing out to all the libraries in the state of Vermont that was like, here's what it is, here's what you can do, blah, blah, blah. I talked to our state legislator, actually, about it because I'm just popped up about it. And he's like, look, realistically, Vermont did our thing, but at a national level, we're going to have to wait for the midterm elections in order to be able to have a different Congress in order to be able to do some things. But thanks for talking about it and being the librarian, I feel like, who's telling people they believe you're not trying to sell them something because we're not, and they believe that they can trust you. I mean, the trust thing is huge when you say, this is actually a thing that's important as opposed to, like, I mean, just the constant sky is falling world we live in nowadays, trying to be like, well, this is one thing that I think maybe deserves 10 minutes of your time, because really the one thing we are kind of selling or trying to buy is people's attention, and you have to respect that that's limited, but at the same time, 
this is the thing you can maybe do a little thing about. You know, I send people to five calls all the time. Like, mm -hmm. here's five calls you can make. Just go do the thing and then you're done for the day. People like that. And this is a small thing that you can put on somebody's plate, do a thing, notify somebody. And if you're a respected person in whatever your job is, being the person who's like, no, I think this is important. I'm not being a nut about it. It's just important. You should know about it. Yeah, and, and I think like to the point about sort of like the perpetual outreach machine and how many things are awful <laughs> every day, um, <laughs> that we have to make sure that net neutrality and ISP privacy don't go the way of the Patriot Act, right? Mm -hmm. Which is to say that we just forget about it and it becomes like the water that we swim in if we're fishies, right? And so we don't even know it's there. Um, and so one way to do that is to keep talking about it and just to say like, oh, did you, you know, don't forget, um, net neutrality is dead and that's bad. <laughs> like, we gotta fix it, you know? <laughs> well, at least I should probably turn down the uh, award yeah. from the, what was it, the NRA or oh, the, the, giant C gun they gave the, the CPAC award. Oh, that, that was so weird. For the the NRA. It, it was amazing. It took him almost two weeks to do it. But. Yes, go ahead. So, I didn't have exactly a question, but um, I had to visit a, a teen space for my adult class, and so the library, the public library I went to, um, has a video camera in their teen space, and they, so I asked them about that, because I didn't see a sign that said that they are have a video camera, but the librarian said that um, the teens know about it, um, they can see it at the reference desk live, um, like view the room. Um, and they keep the, the, they save it for 24 hours and then they, and then they delete it. But they were talking about issues of, um, drugs and that kind of stuff as to why they got it. But, and I, it was, in, it's interesting to listen to you talk because I was like, well, that's kind of cool. Like, does that deter, like, what they're doing? And she's like, yeah, they know it's there. Like, so it just kind of keeps arguing. But I didn't think about it from the other side. Like, I, I'm pretty uneducated about the whole situation, so it's, interesting to hear you talk about it. Um, and the other thing is... They like, just do the drugs outside now. Yeah. 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 Or where the camera's like, in the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. They leave the them in graphic the novels. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you have so many nooks and crannies. Like, <laughs> yeah. That's where yeah. the drugs are being done. But, I thought you were going to say they have sex in there. That was my... Oh, I know. We didn't get into so all the issues. Only drugs. Yeah, right now. This is new, by the way. Yeah, I was a teenager. And you can put notes in people's records. Yeah. Right? You can yeah. put a message in there. And if we got this there's one library in particular that would be like, oh, it's from that library. Like this patron did this, blah, 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 and whatever. Yeah. And you ignored it, it was from that library. And then I know it's, what you're talking you know, about like, shame, though. Sorry? I didn't know which library, but I'm not good. <laughs> <laughs> this was about to get, yeah. this about to get yeah. really good. Oh, okay. I know. <laughs> so there is sort of that. I mean, right? we use a lot of notes in ours, honestly. Well, you, you kind of need them for something. But okay. there's never like about craziness. It's usually like no receipt. Um, yeah. We have, uh, I've seen them like, this patron was picked out of the next library. Oh, X. yeah, no, we have that. I mean, right, but like, that's, and that's like, that's another thing that like the pits thing, like we already, like in Sierra, you can already do that. Right. And like the 42 people immediately in your vicinity can see that. And like in some networks, that's like 108 people. Right. 108 different libraries. So like, Cool. I mean, the idea was like, well, if uh, CW Mars is a problem patron and Minuteman's not going to hear about it, it's like, freaking pick up the phone or put it on a list right. and like, do, like yeah. talk to each other at a conference. Do people have a right to what? access those notes about them? I don't know. No. <laughs> I mean, technically, I yes, but yeah, I, mean, I want to yeah, know realistically. Yeah. <laughs> are you in Minuteman or are you in Boston? I'm in Boston. Uh, I put notes about my I can't that for you. <laughs> I have about 100 days, but. <laughs> My house is the library's address. <laughs> I'm going to make the obvious joke that it's really great you didn't arm pits. So. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. This is only um, tangentially related, but Callan, you brought up that you're, um, we've been talking about security and surveillance, you brought up that you're across from the police station. Yeah. Um, do you feel like that affects what type of patrons you get if there are people that don't want to come in? Because um, I work in an academic library, we're technically open to the public. And we don't have really a ton of public patrons, and part of that is that like there are other better public libraries in the area, right. and part of that is that like we have a lot of e-resources and not a lot of like, newspapers and stuff that people who can hang out the library actually want. We have like a print collection, right? But I think part of it is that we have a security guard stationed right at the front door, and I know that I had um, 
people come for a meeting of the North Five uh, organization that I'm part of. And a lot of people didn't like that there was a security guard. And I was like, hey, like, I know the guy in school, <coughs> like, you're allowed to be here. You just have to write your name down. And so I don't even have to be your name if you're concerned about it. <laughs> um, but it's still like you have to interact with someone that's part of like, right. a, like a surveillance state or the police state. Right. Like, how, how does that kind of affect which patrons you use? So yeah. that's, it's really tough to answer that question, although it's a very good question, because we have three libraries in Brookline. And there's one in Brookline Village, there's one in Coolidge Corner, and there's one in Potterham, which is in Chestnut Hill. And so they're very different areas. All three of those areas are pretty different. Um, you know, Potterham is kind of in the middle of, you know, it's not, it's not the middle of nowhere, but it's South Brookline. Uh, it's, you know, not really publicly accessible or public transit accessible. There's no bus or train that goes out there. It's mostly patronized by people who live in the immediate vicinity. Coolidge Corner is an extremely busy library. It's the busiest branch in the whole state of Massachusetts, busier than all the BPL branches, obviously, Whoa. including wow. Central. Yeah. So they get, that library is little. Who here has been to Coolidge Corner? Anybody? It's tiny, right? We have a thousand people come in there every single day. Wow. Yeah, insanity. <laughs> so, and that's very urban over there. And it's also across, like, not really across the street, but Kitty Corner to the T. Yeah, and then Brooklyn Village Library. Brooklyn Village is a very, um, you know, kind of posh part of town. The schools are surrounding it, so there's two elementary schools that are on our campus, and then the uh, high schools nearby, and there's many residences and like kind of classier restaurants and businesses around the main library, in addition to that police station across the street. So, you know, do we have a different type of patron at any one of those three libraries as opposed to one of the others? Certainly, yeah. Um, I don't know that, I, I can't really attest to uh, the police really having too much of an influence on who comes in because we certainly do still have you know problem patrons <laughs> and we do have people i mean the library at brookline village is a giant monolithic i mean humongous that it's it, there's many nooks and crannies that people just kind of hang out in all day long um and you know we certainly have people who we do have to serve those on trespasses too and i think that mostly probably happens in brookline village um a little bit in coolidge corner but they they have a community police station right near there as well so it's hard to really answer just because the three libraries are so very different. Well, Matt, this actually, I think, brings us around to when we first met and you were working at MIT, which was open to the public, as I recall. Yes, still yes. is. Still is, right, still yep. is. And that was an interesting experience. I mean, Bentley is not, right? No, Bentley is pretty rural. Uh, we have maybe one uh, community user that we but technically, it's open to the public. It is. Unlike oh, Harvard. Yes. <laughs> well, no, Harvard's a pain in the neck, believe me. But, but what makes Bentley open? I mean, why is it's just policy? It's just too policy. hard to get to. It's, yeah, it's way open. Yeah. But most academic libraries are open to the public. No, I didn't, yeah. I didn't actually know that. No, right. Yeah, you were one of those to access. Yeah, and your loo is in Harvard's unusual around here for me. Is that true for electronic resources too? No. no. Well, on site. <laughs> no. I was like, oh, on site. <laughs> that, yeah. That ends darkly. In, in the library. Okay. Got it. <laughs> Are there, yes, please, go ahead. Um, I have a question, sort of bringing it back to tech instruction. Um, specifically for you, Jessamine, since you were talking about that. Um, so how do you help people overcome their fears of their devices or their, or their fears of you know, sort of exploring and, and playing with their things and, and fears about security as well with that. Well, we do a lot of scaffolding with the work that I do. So a lot of times it's like the dentist, right? I tend to see more people who show up because they have problems than people who are just coming in for preventative maintenance because nobody comes in for preventative maintenance even though you would like them to. Um, so we spend a lot of time um, breaking whatever it is that they need to do down into really concrete steps, having achievements that they could get to at all the levels. Like, hey, you figured out your password. Nice gun. Because realistically, people should feel good about doing things well, regardless of whether I think it's a tiny thing or a big thing. So scaffolding, a lot of positive encouragement. Um, I do have this thing that I talk about where it's like, you get 30 seconds to complain, so use it wisely. But seriously, like people really want to tell you the horror story of why they got to where they are, like the dentist, about like, 
well, my husband, he was the one who did the thing, and then when he left me for that lady, he met on the internet, and you're just like, <laughs> like I do not yeah, want to hear any of this stuff, it's really. But like, I'll be like, okay, 30 seconds, but then we're going to move on and talk about the thing. And then anything else that they're like, oh, the computer hates me, I'm like, well, sounds like a personal problem. Let's move on. But like being upbeat about it. Like there's, I try to be as unjudgmental as I possibly can. Like I'm being kind of jokey about it here. But like person to person, never. Like really never. Except to say something like, remember how you said you were going to do that thing last week? How about the thing you said you were going to do, kind of. And so encouraging them to do things that are good, explaining to them that maybe the person who was rude to them before maybe just was dealing with their own personal problems and it wasn't nice for them to say their password was stupid or whatever the thing is. Like we have little kind of friendly chats about, because a lot of people have talked to a tech person who has given them badgering advice. And, it's, and, and that actually forms a lot of people's <coughs> negative feelings about technology. Because I figure if you're like coming in with your phone and you've never, whatever, downloaded an app, whatever the thing is, and it's 2018, there's probably a reason and it's not because you didn't get around to it. There's probably emotional issues, social issues, personal issues. I mean, it's like institutionalized poverty. It's like hunger. You know, you don't fix the hunger problem by giving somebody a sandwich. You have to deal with sort of concrete social causes. And so I don't get super into it, but I do sometimes suggest to people that like, their relationship with their computer is not healthy, um, that, that the computer is really a calculator and it doesn't have feelings, but it's our job to sort of figure it out. I do a lot of kind of expectation setting and normative settings. Like, you know, you're having a hard time using this website and that's because it is terrible. Like, that's the judging that we do get into. It's like, it's you and me against your computer and we're going to make it do what you want because that's its job and we need to talk to it about how to do that. And so the only kind of negativity that comes in is being like, you know, this website isn't very good and it's probably not very good because that person didn't get paid a lot to make it because if they were somebody who got paid a lot to make websites, they wouldn't be making government websites in Vermont. You know, like seriously. You and, and that's why, like we all live here for great reasons. And so trying to really have the interaction be positive to the extent possible to try and help them link to other resources in their community. Like, in my dream world, drop-in time dissipates because nobody ever needs it again. Um, but pointing out, hey, you can go to the library. Hey, did you know the community college library is open until 10 p.m. and you can print 25 pages for free? Hey, did you know they've got broadband at the coffee shop and really good snacks? Like, trying to help people use other resources so they don't look at me as their only lifeline to this. And then as far as security on top of that, or sort of safety, kind of building that in and also kind of modeling good behavior. Like I make a joke about my house being unlocked because it makes me laugh. But like I use two-factor authentication on my email and I explain to people what that is because it's safer. And like we're a small town. Everybody uses one of two banks. I tell them how to like this is how you can set up web banking. This is how when the bank emails you, you can have a little security line that comes in your email so you know that email's from the bank. A lot of people don't know that that's a thing. They just assume internet banking is hard, impossible, dangerous, or whatever. And so I try to help them. So like whenever I get email from my bank, it says, this is your bank. We are not fucking around. <laughs> but that's how I know it's from my bank, and it makes me happy. But telling people that they can actually have some ownership of these technological systems that they feel stuck in can help them feel a little bit of agency, which is sometimes what's missing. And sometimes people just have like personalities that are going to be really difficult for learning stuff. And so you try to figure out how to meet them where they are, which is you know, super important, and see how you can get them a little bit farther down the road, not being like, well, we're totally going to get you on GitHub this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> because maybe we're not, but maybe that's a good goal. And then you scaffold up to that goal, and you realize that that scaffolding is going to be different for other people. I spend so much time just kind of calling bullshit on a lot of the other things people have said without 
being negative, but just being like, you can understand why Google does what they do, but that's because they're a giant advertising agency. I, um, I just want to make one quick comment. There's a really great uh, list of things, list of things you can do to help people use a computer from oh, like film. Yeah. Bill. Yeah, which I got from your <laughs> I was gonna give you credit because I saw it on your blog. It's called How to Help Someone Use a Computer from Phil. How do you say his last name? I say it Agree. Agree. Yeah, it's on Jasmine's site. H-E-R-E, -E, how to help someone use a computer. It's, it's so good. I mean, it was written probably, what, 20 years ago? And it's so relevant. Yeah. yeah, it's just a lot of simple truisms to remember when you're helping someone who doesn't know computers. And it's just like little kind of cones, philosophy stuff. Yeah, like but, no one's born knowing this stuff. You've forgotten what it was like to learn that kind of stuff. When you look at a user's computer, it may be in a weird state. This is actually normal, so just you know, move forward. Don't spend a lot of time being like. But I was going to say, <laughs> as a follow-up. You do that internally. Right? <laughs> yeah. I spend a lot of time doing this internally. <laughs> <It's, it's, laughs> that's what I always think. I was going to do as a follow-up to Justin that it's I actually. I actually yeah. spent a year doing um, tech support, and so I sort of get the response, like after six months of having plugged in your computer, it's hard to keep a certain tone out of your voice. When Every you now it. and again, I turn this off and on again, and it fixes the problem, so it keeps me humble. I will tell you that when my staff do that and it fixes their problem, they are so happy. Right. They I, feel so empowered. But I would, oh, I, would offer, I, would offer, I would offer as a supplement to what Callan is saying, is that if you do a quick YouTube search for a tech support comedian, there is an absolutely hysterical 10 or 12 minute monologue by this stand-up comedian, although he's sitting in a tech support chair, about providing tech support over the phone to someone. You have to watch it. It is brilliant. Um, I don't remember the name of it, but it's super easy to find. Um, so, any other questions for these guys? Uh, Librarian.net, or you can just email me at jessamine at gmail.com if you want to find something specific. Any last comments that you'd like to make, wrapping up what we've uh, if people want to see the privacy talk that I give, actually, if you just go to librarian.net slash talks, D-A-L-K-S, slash privacy17, because I started giving this talk last year, there's a really good kind of what I talk about, as well as a meta talk, if you're a librarian wanting to talk to your patrons community or whatever about it, there's like a talk with a talk wrapped around it that talks about kind of things to think about. It's kind of what I've been working on this year. Um, but again, just like open lines of communication, you've got questions, I'm happy to talk to people. And I feel like attitude and up for itness is so much more important than anything you personally know about a computer yourself. Um, and I think that's a good lesson for librarians who may worry that they don't know enough to help a person do a thing. That usually just being up for it means you know enough. Perfect. Okay. Um, if you want to get involved in uh, fighting for privacy issues in Massachusetts, you should let me know. Yeah. There is a chapter, uh, well, I guess it's a, a social responsibility and intellectual freedom committee within the Massachusetts Library Association. So I think I, I said their acronym in the incorrect formation, but it's like the I have publics in Brooklyn. Yeah, exactly, right? I know, it's like broken my brain forever, putting the cart before the horse. I think it's the Intellectual Freedom and Social Responsibility Committee, I believe, of MLA. And there's, they're pretty active, but they are really looking for new membership. Um, and they are really looking for, like, specifically new grads to join in. Join so, any committee and you can be yes. in charge of it within the next so six true. to 12 months. 100% true. <laughs> also cannot overstate the importance <laughs> of being at conferences like the MLA conference at the state level and also the NILA conference at the regional level because things like that, the pits, where it was actually addressed at the MLA conference. Yeah. And don't forget as students you get discounts for membership and there's money available to attend the conferences through LISA. And there's a good joint membership deal for NILA and MLA right now, too. So cool. that's cool. Matt? Um, well, for um, my work in copyright um, and best practices, there's the Center for Social Media Impact. That, so good. Yeah, they create a lot of best practices in different disciplines for uh, best practices for fair use and other um, 
other realms. Um, so it's a really good website. Um, just a bunch of partnerships. Um, documentary film. Uh, poetry. Poetry. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really good. It's been my go-to spot to, to get guidance. Well, and I'm, I'm actually kind of sorry that we didn't have as much time to kind of delve into fair use or first sale or some of these other kind of naughty. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, no, no, but, but they're fascinating topics. And, you know, I, I, I both worry about fair use of my own stuff, but then also benefit from fair use quite a bit. And, you know, one of the things, just kind of wrap this up, like when you're quoting a tweet, right? I've got a couple of projects where I'm going to be doing that a lot. Good luck this week. Well, because there was that big lawsuit, like, last month. Uh, well, fill me in, because I missed right. that. <laughs> but, no, seriously, I mean, how do you fair use, like, a tweet where it's 10% of the work? Like, is that the first two words, or what is it, 24 characters now? Out of Committed tweets in journals? Yeah. It was about fed. The case is about photographs, right? Yeah, oh, so, yeah. like, it happened okay. to involve photographs. Yeah, like, yes. you're, like, yeah. putting, you know, if you somebody takes a picture and then you put it on your website as an embedded... Yeah. Embed a tweet oh, with right. a journalistic that's like copyright, copyright violation. Right. Well, sure, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's but that's kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we're <laughs> delving in. We're delving hey, into the whole the, the whole internet's illegal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I knew it. So don't keep a like out of small scale. Like let's just look up. Yeah. Well, there is actually that. a hyperlink lawsuit that I saw kicking. Never I know. I know. They're all, they pop up like weeds. Anyway, I'd like to thank the panel here. <laughs> I'm going to ask them to shift over and act like judges in the voice while I uh, do a very condensed version of my Cyber Traps for Librarians uh, presentation. Yes, you can please go ahead and Cool. Yes, sit wherever you want. Wow. And, uh, cool. Anyway, I'd like to thank you. you. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. will be chatting thank afterwards. You very much. Um, excellent Thanks. job. Thank you. Really well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank All right, let's power this up, and I will blast through this. Thank you. What's that? So we're doing this on a fast basis, which means that, um, as I said, you will not get the super cool font issues, but that is okay. Um, so let me just thank, once again, the folks who are presenting here today. Um, I am Frederick Lane, as Laura was so kind to introduce me. Um, I have been writing now for 20 years, and in the last three or four years, I started to do this um, Cyber Traps series of books, and it started with this one, which was Cyber Traps for the Young. And the idea about this book was that it occurred to me that with these mobile devices and with computer technology, we were giving kids the capability of committing crimes in ways that we had never really imagined. And unfortunately, a lot of those crimes um, involved teachers. And because of that, and because of my work on the Burlington School Board, 
I began writing Cyber Traps for Educators, which has formed the bulk of my work over the last few years, going out and doing professional development, uh, training teachers, dealing with departments of education. And I'm in the process of turning this into version 2.0, uh, which incorporates a lot of different ethical considerations that teachers are working on. And then last summer, I did this book, which was Cyber Traps for Expecting Moms and Dads. And it really is designed to help people understand some of the um, legal issues and privacy issues surrounding pregnancy. So everything from should you put your sonogram online, um, which has medical information around the edge, should you register your child's domain name, should you Google the availability of a domain name before you name the child, um, are you appropriating the child's identity by putting photos online on Facebook over a period of time? Um, because when they turn 13, maybe they don't want to be, you know, like the little fashionista, maybe they want to go completely goth, but they've got 13 years of photos that they have to push back against. So there are some really interesting issues out there. When I was doing the course for Laura, and she has to sit through a lot of these slides in repetition, um, I was researching, and it turns out that this is the first lending library, not the first public library, but the first lending library in the United States. And they actually named it after the town, after Franklin, when Franklin was still alive. And so he showed up at the opening of the library and donated part of his library uh, to them. And I was really excited to see Franklin's books and drove like 45 minutes out of the way on my way up to Boston to take this photo. And unfortunately, they're rehabbing their library. And so the books are in cold storage somewhere and they, they're not available for another six months. Um, we talked a little bit about Carnegie Libraries and it turns out that this, uh, my hometown childhood library is a Carnegie Library from, I think it was 1902, and the town got a $12,500 grant from the Carnegie Foundation uh, to build the Rockland Memorial Library, which is very cute. And like so many other libraries now, they've got a great big kind of modern expansion on the back of it. So, as Laura pointed out, and, and as I was mentioning with respect to my conversations with Matt, the, the Cybertrap series that I've been working on has really been designed to look at the legal issues that arise from the use of technology. So my working definition, I think I will run out of space here, is that it is an unintended or undesirable consequence that results from the use or misuse of a digital device. So relatively broad definition, but it gives me a lot of room to run with these different topics. And it was a great extension of the work I've been doing to do Cybertraps uh, for librarians. So we ran through some of the same um, issues that people face in a variety of other professions. So we were talking, for instance, about the productivity challenges that librarians face in their workplace. And I will say, in general, it is my impression that librarians are an unusually dedicated lot. But there are still things like emails that you know get in the way. There's web surfing. It's very easy to be doing research and go down an internet rabbit hole in one way or another. Mobile devices are the worst because they ping, they, they grab our attention, all of the rest of that. So like everybody else, librarians are dealing with these productivity issues. Hostile work environment unfortunately arises. Um, I'm, uh, my data is much heavier in the teacher realm um, in this respect, so I'll give you a couple of examples. There was one teacher in Wales who spent by the IT department's estimation, over 70 uh, instructional hours during the school year, uh, emailing her colleagues in a harassing fashion, and you know, trying to basically get them into trouble, having fights with them in email. Um, and then the great thing about that was that when she got caught, she actually tried to throw her paraeducators under the bus, and basically saying that they had logged in as her. So this is the kind of stuff that arises. A more common scenario for a hostile work environment is going to be where people are collecting stuff off the internet and then they're distributing it to their colleagues. Uh, they could be obviously offensive uh, memes of one kind or another. Uh, they could be jokes. It doesn't matter. But obviously there's a variety of different ways in which technology can be used to cause problems. The bulk of our conversation, I would say, over the course of the week, and Shannon can fill in if uh, 
she sees fit, was really groping, uh, grappling with, groping with, I guess is now the common phrase for our political realm, um, grappling with the privacy concerns that we face as individuals, but then also as users of a library. And so here are some of the policy considerations that we were going over. Number one, what is the connection between intellectual freedom as, and then the duty to report? You know, obviously, um, we see a big push in particularly urban areas along the lines of, if you see something, say something. Um, I'm on the you know, New York subway constantly. That is drummed into our heads by posters, by you know, uh, conductor announcements, and so forth. And there is arguably a moral concern there, right? That if you see an imminent threat, is it, you know, where is the balance going to come down? Is it pure intellectual freedom, or are we actually trying to preserve lives? And, you know, librarians do have an opportunity to observe behavior on the part of people. That can be concerning. And so this is a tension, I think, that a lot of people face. Sometimes there's a legal obligation. If you see an individual who is engaged in viewing, for instance, child pornography um, on a computer, a, you know, in a number of states there is a specific mandated requirement to report that as evidence of harm to a child. Um, and then obviously, God forbid, you saw someone taking photos in a bathroom or something like that. Um, there is a point at which intellectual freedom just stops. Um, so there's that, there's the moral obligation. And one of the things that we were talking about with the students was this idea of least feasible data collection. What is the least amount of information you need to get from a patron in order to do the functions of the library? And so that's a good way to kind of frame this conversation. Are we collecting more information than we need to just because we can? And one of the problems we face with technology, as I'm sure all the panelists will agree, is that it makes data collection staggeringly easy. And then the other thing that you run into is the shortest necessary data retention. And I was interested actually to hear, I guess it was you talk about the fact that the videos are wiped out or deleted. Well, as someone who works in the field of computer forensics, I constantly deal with the fact that data doesn't get deleted. That those images, you know, unless you're active about scrubbing them, reside on a hard drive somewhere. And so they are still potentially retrievable. Um, and that goes back to decisions made 40 years ago by Steve Jobs, you know, Bill Gates, Paul Allen. All of the early computer um, innovators were trying to figure out how to deal with this. And their solution was, because the hardware is so slow, we're not going to delete the data. We're just going to kind of erase the memory in the master file table. But all the data is still on the hard drive. And now, 30, 40 years later, we have a multi-billion dollar computer forensics industry that is based on that one decision. So when we talk about privacy, we have to keep in mind that sometimes the technology pushes back against our efforts to create privacy just by the way it functions. And I think all of our panelists today talked about the fact that a significant piece of this is educating patrons about what goes on and what their rights are, what, their, what the implications are of what's going on. And my sense from talking to the students and then also listening today is that there's often a lot of organizational inertia against that kind of transparency. And that's something we need to deal with, I think, in, in more places than just libraries. But libraries should be at the forefront of being really transparent about what information they're handling and how they're handling it. Okay. A uh, quick rundown on physical security of data, because I think librarians need to consider these possibilities. Number one, where is it? Where physically in the building is the data stored or outside of the building? And then what kind of access control do you have? So things like, what is the physical layout? Is it easy for patrons to see what's going on? The example of the hold shelf, I think, was really brilliant. You know, that without a careful examination as to how that is handled, it is possible for people to see information about who's borrowing which books just by walking by. And so it's an effort to make the library more efficient, but that very efficiency impinges on privacy. Related to that is within the organization itself, who needs to access information? So for instance, as Callan was talking about the notes 
in the, um, the system there, the uh, Minuteman system, who gets access to that information? Is it someone who actually needs to have it? And then <laughs> sometimes this very simple step gets overlooked. Like, do we have adequate locks to handle this data? Nothing very complicated. Here's something I think we should be discussing in more detail, which is the regular use of encryption for data. Um, one of the things that I try to do is to have a backup system on my computer that goes into something like Carbonite, which is a one-way funnel that is encrypted using a password that only I know. So Carbonite has no way to read the data in the backup that they do for me. So it doesn't matter if the FBI shows up, it's just gibberish. Some people will actually go the next step, and, and Jessamine, you may talk about this, in terms of encrypting their personal computer. Um, that gets complicated in terms of whether or not you have to turn over your password or not. And that's even more of an issue when you're coming into the United States, because there's been some very disturbing rulings about the ability of Homeland Security to do these kinds of random device searches. And then lastly, we talked obviously a lot about privacy screens, how they impact uh, the you know, security or the, um, the ability of patrons to look at material without other people knowing what's going on. Um, that, again, is a double-edged sword if you're concerned that someone's looking at contraband material. So, one of the things actually that was kind of fun about this was that in contrast to teachers who provide endless number of examples of the misuse of social media, librarians are a remarkably well-behaving bunch. It's really, I actually built an assignment around misuse of social media, and we had to put it off a day because they were having so much trouble finding examples. So kudos to you all, that's great. Um, but there are still examples out there of librarians who have hassled their political leaders over budget cuts or things like that, other kinds of policy changes. There was a case of a librarian who posed with an AR-15 um, in the recent controversy and put that up on social media. So one of the things that I talk about all the time with teachers is thinking about the potential implications of social media use and realizing that there is absolutely an audience factor out there that you need to keep in mind. One of the things also that librarians should recall or keep in mind is that you may put in your little Twitter bio that retweets are not endorsements, but as someone who works with the public, forget about it. That will be viewed that way. So it does need to be something that you think about. Uh, there was a great example actually involving the Burlington, Vermont School Board recently. Uh, I don't know if you heard about this, Jessica. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I took this very personally as a former board member, but uh, there was this individual on the board from the north end of the city, which is a little more conservative. He sh reshared a whole bunch of memes on Facebook. And he just spent a couple of nights clicking share, share, share. And did it in a very non-thoughtful way. And he just was kind of hitting reshare for things he thought his family would laugh about. Unfortunately, they were pretty offensive, a large number of them particularly in a, a progressive city like Burlington. So it hit the fan in large quantities, and there was an actual effort by the board to censor him. I think they did actually censure him, which is meaningless, because there's no, there's no mechanism in Vermont for removing a board member. Um, and he's up for re-election. Actually, wasn't it this March? I have to see the election results. When was town meeting day? Like uh, two weeks ago. Yeah. yeah, I have to see if he got, yeah, if he did check, that'd be great. Um, obviously, hostile attacks on colleagues, local officials, parents, kids, really not good things to do with social media. Um, there's definitely a that's not funny aspect to this. You may think it's hysterical, but um, you have to read the audience. Inappropriate sharing TMI. We have teachers who are sort of avid social media users. Again, not something I've caught librarians doing, but um, sharing their interests in nudist societies or kind of their, you know, tweeting out inappropriate images of themselves, et cetera, and so forth. Um, it's really kind of crazy. Um, and the peril of memes, um, you know, look, some of them are pretty funny when you get right down to it, but um, 
on the other hand, you kind of really have to be careful. <laughs> I, I, I was really glad somebody brought up Game of Thrones knowing that Peter Dinklage was in the slide deck, so that's all perfectly done. Cyber safety. Uh, a lot of our conversation was dealing with what are the responsibilities for librarians in terms of cyber safety of themselves, personal information, financial data, all the rest of that, but much more importantly, the cyber safety of their patrons. Precisely the kind of stuff that Jessamyn's talking about in terms of protecting yourself online, understanding what the risks are. These are key pieces of information for children to really get a grasp of what could happen to them online. And I'm not talking about the massive random stranger danger thing that, that gets overblown. But much more realistically, you know, the interactions with their peers in terms of cyberbullying, um, cyber harassment, things like that. What are the risks associated with sexting? Um, I would make the argument, and I have been making it all along, that we need to be much more frank about these conversations. Um, we need to recognize that 75 or 80% of high school kids will have sexted by the time they graduate. It's just going to happen. It's the modern version of playing doctor. It is hormone-driven courtship. Let's just get on board with that and talk about it and really help kids understand what the implications are um, I just got back from Kentucky yesterday where I was talking to uh, the Kentucky Association of State Administrators and one of the topics of conversation was that a principal is now facing nine years in prison because he was routinely seizing cell phones from kids in the school and was downloading any nudes that he found and used them to trade for other nudes using, uh, you know, a non- I, I, what is it? Image dot are you? It's one of the imager. Im yeah. Not not imager. It's it's a it's an anonymous image site based in Russia. So it ends in dot are you? I forget which one it is. But in any case, a lot of times the only way to participate is to trade. So he was stealing these kids' images, and then using them as currency, basically. And you know, none of us want to talk about that with kids. Absolutely, none of us want to do that. But we need to do so. We need to help kids understand what the potential consequences are, and if they're going to do that, what steps they need to take in order to protect themselves. So, you know, let's, let's not be moralistic about it, but let's be practical in terms of protecting kids. And to a limited degree, I think libraries play a role in helping to provide that education. Um, even as someone was talking today, even if you have to put the informative books behind the counter because parents are freaking out, um, at least have them. Critical thinking is a big, big piece of this. You may have uh, seen this photo floating around in the mid-2000s. Uh, this was supposedly the last photo taken by this tourist on his smartphone. Um, and it took only about five minutes for Snopes and a bunch of other people to disabuse us that this was a real thing. But it's still out there as kind of a thing. And so this is sort of the headwind that we all push against in terms of educating people properly. Actually, I didn't put it in this particular slide deck, but there was a, a great, uh, there's a wonderful online cartoon, if you haven't seen it, XKCD. Absolutely brilliant, one of my favorites. And one of the XKCD panels is about how Snopes secretly seeds the internet with these false stories and then debunks them in order to generate traffic. And then the person in the last panel says, wait a minute, that's not true. I'll go on to Snopes and, and, then, and it's just like horribly circular. Um, so lastly, freedom and censorship, um, obviously uh, that is at the core of what libraries are about. Um, so I put our grand uh, Library of Congress on to symbolize this. But there is no mission, I would argue, that is more relevant to where we are today than having libraries promote freedom and avoiding censorship. And I think what, is, what has been personally inspiring to me over the last two weeks is, is just the fact that there is this institutional awareness of the, important of intellectual, the importance of intellectual freedom and the willingness to stand up for it as individuals and as organizations. I, I did not realize how much I owed to librarians, but I think I'm a little bit closer to appreciating it. 
So, for those of you who might be interested, um, I will put this very abbreviated slide deck up on slideshare.net along with my other stuff. Here's my contact information. If you have any follow-up questions, uh, please don't hesitate to let me know. Um, and that being said, I'm happy to entertain questions right now, um, both on today and, and what I was doing last week with the students. How did they react to digital sex ed um, you know, it's interesting. That's a relatively liberal group, so they were on board with it, and then they go out into the real world and they have to deal with Matt Bevins, who's trying to slash them by 20%. Yeah. Yeah, it's brutal. Um, no, look, they're educators. They want to educate. That being said, I'd say roughly about 15 or 20% of the administrators were from private Christian schools, oh, wow. and they were not on board with that. Yeah. But on the other hand, they get the... the um, my lecture was cyber traps for educators, and then also, interestingly, you would have liked this, the collecting of data from cell phones in the school environment. Yeah. So I was educating them about the limitations on that. They get the psychic and emotional and, and legal impact of boundary violations, inappropriate relationships. So even if you're in a Christian school, you're worried about that. It's just there's a big difference about how you're going to approach the solution. You know, whereas if you're in a public school, they're more inclined slightly to be open about the sexuality piece. In the Christian schools, they just want bigger penalties. That that's, that's the way you do it. And you, you find the point at which people are deterred from actually sleeping with their students. And my argument is, without proper education on both ends, it's not going to stop. And so the bulk of my cyber traps conversation, and this is actually an interesting distinction, um, teachers are with kids now, you know, what, six, eight, sometimes ten hours a day. And the bulk of the problem stems from the fact that roughly 90% of high school students have their own phone number, which means parents are now bypass, bypassable, and often bypassed in terms of teacher-student communication. And then beyond that, since the vast majority of those phones are smartphones, you've got all of the other communication channels WhatsApp, Kick, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Vine, Periscope, you name it. So the list is literally endless of the ways a predatory teacher could communicate with a student. The real problem, the cyber trap piece of this that I talk about, is that a well-meaning teacher can wind up in a conversation with a student if they both have contact information that neither intended when they began, but at 2 in the morning after 300 exchange text messages, they're now having. And the classic scenario, time after time, will be that you will transition from what page is the homework on to I'm having a miserable time at home and I don't have anybody to talk to. And so the vulnerability there can be either on the part of the student or all too often on the part of the 25-year-old teacher who's unhappy in her marriage. And you go from there. Yeah, it's really, it's intense stuff. Um, I, I was pleased with the reception. We'll see if they invite me back. I mean, because they, you know, it was an attempt to lay out some really frank information for them. So, any other questions on cyber traps issues? Yes? This is sort of related, but as people were talking in the library panel, um, you know, people often are like, well, what can we do? And, uh, you know, I come from a sort of a specific perspective that I feel like kind of libraries aren't or shouldn't be neutral, but that's really come across mainly as a result of kind of this administration and a lot of the, like, crazy stuff they're doing. Um, how much do you talk about, because it sounds like one of the things you're saying is, you know, the threat of losing funding or people's concerns about their own economic security is one of the things that kind of keeps them on the straight and narrow. Mm -hmm. How much do you um, talk about or feel like it's okay to talk about when you're sort of giving advice, manipulating the way things are funded in order to sort of work on the results that you want? You know what I mean? I mean, because it sounds a little bit like what you need to be doing talks to schools about or, you know, businesses or whoever it is that you're talking to about, like, moving their money around differently. 
do you get to that level of stuff, or do you leave them to kind of figure out how to implement the suggestions that you make about general ideas? Mostly door number two, but occasionally I'll get into the weeds and the side conversations. And my experience has been that the particularities, you know, particularly for a conference like this, which was statewide, and so you've got people from really poor rural eastern Kentucky to slightly more urban Louisville and Lexington and things like that. So there's very different experiences culturally, politically, financially. So it's not worth it for me to try to say, in your district, you know, take yeah, from don't this get pump. these guys more money or give those guys more money. Right, right, right. And, and so on the other hand, when I'm talking to people getting, you know, coffee or whatever, then you start to get into some of the particulars about how you can implement these things. And, you know, the biggest thing is really helping the teachers to think about what their role is. Because I think one of the most interesting aspects of this is that to a disturbing level, you see teacher of the year in the headlines for these things. And part of that is just clickbait, right? If you're going to have a teacher going bad, it's way better if it's a teacher of the year going bad because that really grabs people. But there's also a statistically relevant aspect to that, which is that those teachers and others like them are very empathetic, and they really want to reach the kids where the kids are. And so if the kid is on Instagram, or if the kid is really active on Twitter, their pushback is, hey, this is where the kid talks. I can reach this kid here. The problem being, that there's no transparency, there's an immediacy and an intimacy to electronic communication. I mean, we talk about it being distancing. I completely disagree. I actually think that there's a real intimacy to electronic communication because it's immediate. And then, you know, as you point out, these conversations wind up happening bedroom to bedroom at night. And you never think about that, but implicitly it's in the back there. And so the kids take advantage of it, the teachers do. Yeah. Matt? Um, in regards to that, um, how effective is policy? Well, <laughs> that's a fair question. Uh, look, policy is only as effective as the training, I think, that goes with it, right? If you can have whatever policies you want. But if it's not clearly a value of the district, you know, if it's just a piece of paper, then, yeah, it doesn't mean anything. Um, but I think, you know, what, what, what I've been arguing for in some of these other presentations is the idea of a culture of cyber safety, that, that you really take a holistic approach to this. Like, actually, we didn't remind, remember the bullying initiative that was about 10, 15 years ago? And the concept behind that bullying initiative was that the entire school community was responsible for observing and responding to any potential act of bullying. And each individual cohort within the school community was given different training that was relevant to their role within the school. And I, that's what I think you need to do vis-a-vis -vis cyber safety. And to finish the thought that I started on before I lost it is that, you know, one of the problems that you run into with these really empathetic teachers is that they see a child having a problem. And they act, they want to act like a social worker or a therapist. And they're not trained to do that. And part of what we need to do, and this gets to your point, Matt, is that we need to help teachers recognize when their role is shifting. And all of this is relevant to librarians, lest we lose the thread of our conversation today, but on a much lower scale because you don't interact with students that consistently. You know, there may be programs that run one, two, three hours. But I would also argue that there are a lot of situations, and in fact, I'm sure the public librarians here can speak to this even better than I can, but where you do end up building relationships with mm -hmm. patrons, um, that you see them over and over again, day after day, for years sometimes, and where we're, we, I say we loosely, but we're being <laughs> called on to act as therapists, social workers, etc., when we're dealing with people who have needs, it, it's very similar because they have needs that expand far beyond mm -hmm. the parameters of what the library can provide. And you have a librarian who has not been trained to identify these problems right. or to work with them. Um, somebody mentioned earlier the lack of social services and how that's pushing libraries to take on a lot more of these roles, right? And, and if we don't learn how to identify these problems and make good referrals, then we find ourselves in that exact same spot. 
case. That's really interesting, actually. I hadn't thought of that. But I, I think what you're, what you're making me think of is this idea that the internet is so all-encompassing that it blurs all of these boundaries. And I, you know, I don't know how often a librarian might be called upon to give out his or her personal number vis-a-vis um, -vis a teacher, for instance. But that would be something I would strongly <laughs> discourage. <laughs> yeah. But it, just extending on that, especially with adjustments drop-in time, a librarian will go from never seeing someone before to immediately in their intimate life trying to help them with a question. Yeah. So whereas a teacher and yeah. student might have to develop a relationship over time. Not that librarians don't do that with their regular patrons. Right. But patrons will come in because they trust us and just tell us everything. Right You're right in there. Whether you want it or not. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and for staff, that makes a lot of staff, at least my library, really uncomfortable to the point that they don't want to help sure. the patron. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we heard stories actually last week of, of patrons walking in and saying, I need help with my tax return. Oh, yeah. And Your it's dating fall. profile. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 all the time. Yeah. Or just setting it up? She asked me why to review her profile and tell her why she wasn't getting dates. As a, from a guy's point of view. I have oh. never asked you do. I'm so yes. excited. Yes. 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 I know. I don't want to do that. I know. I don't <laughs> hey guys, it only takes one sign at the desk. <laughs> <laughs> Take your drop-in hour. And if you structure it and you set it up, it can be something that's awesome, right? Yeah. Like you right. do that's a program to help everyone get yeah. a better profile, but just Oh but boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. My advice on that is <laughs> it have a team of two. I mean, I would, I would, you know, a lot of the cyber traps that I talk about are avoidable on, or through the use of transparency. And that's the thing, you know, if, if a kid texts you at some weird hour of the night, whether you're a teacher or a librarian, Unless it is a life-threatening emergency, my response is you you write back adding another adult to the conversation and you say, see me in the morning or contact one of your classmates because the, the, the slope is so steep for this. And I think this is the thing. It's not, you know, I've managed to build a business out of a relatively numerically small problem, which I'm really grateful for. But it's good to remind people that it is a numerically small problem. It's just that the impact on the individuals involved is profound. And then, of course, the impact on the profession writ largely is profound because of the newspaper coverage. You know, so yes, it's not likely that any individual is going to fall into these traps. But if, if they do, the consequences are disproportionate to the numbers involved. Um, so that's that's a good chunk of why I do this, just to try to prevent at least one more of these cases from arising, um, because that seems like a good day's work, you know, if you can do that. But I think institutionally, to get back to Matt's point, it, it we want to, we don't want to talk about this stuff. Believe me, I, I mark it all the time, and they don't want to talk about this stuff. But um, those that do, I think, have a real advantage, because they're trying to take a broad-based solution to these issues. It's not easy. It really isn't. I don't know. How about Bentley? How does Bentley address any of this? I mean, you have a different age cohort. Yeah, I mean, we're, we have received some training as far as identifying stress, um, particularly during finals, because um, okay. we are, you know, the reference status. Um, even just um, identifying somebody who might need counseling. Yeah. Um, so we have a listing of resources to direct them to and you know campus and stuff like that. But we know where our role ends as a support and where we need to refer to. So you're not offering to get someone a cup of coffee and talk things through. No. <laughs> That's probably just as well. Well one of the things that I found really helpful in the library world over the last like two years or so um, that I've seen it is the concept of mental health first aid. Like we spend a lot of our librarians to like CPR training, or you learn how to use the the heart attack machine, or whatever the thing is. But yeah. there's a new group of people um, that'll help like community uh, mental health practitioners do mental health first aid because there are a lot of people dealing with mental health challenges that come to the library all the time. Whatever, great. 
Um, but figuring out how to tell the difference if somebody's in crisis versus somebody's just behaving oddly versus somebody may actually need some like mental health care or medical care quick is actually a great way to help people who literally do need your kind of checklist. Like add another person to the conversation, that's the thing, because people a lot of times can get their head around something like that, or you know, this kind of delusion is probably not a problem, but this kind of delusion really might be a situation. But for a lot of people who don't have a lot of experience with whatever the thing is, yeah. you know, you're a new teacher, you have no experience with like 13, 14 year old kids texting you about how things are at home. Just having like a checklist to follow, That's especially when to get to the not your job thing. That's is one of the things that's super helpful. And I talk up mental health first aid a lot because I'm like, look, if you learn to do CPR, the chances that somebody's going to come into your library and have a heart attack are lower than somebody's going to come into your library and possibly having a mental health crisis. We're prepared for this. We're totally not prepared for that. It's a great point. And you could be. Yeah. One of the big pushes down in New York City is to give mental health training to first responders um, because oftentimes you know, they're confronted with really you know, challenging mental health issues. And without that training, it tends to escalate into more physical responses as opposed to not. Well, and people make paradoxical choices because they think they're in one kind of situation when often they're in a different situation. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, it, it's not an area actually I know all that much about and, and would be hesitant to really dive into. Um, any other questions that people would like to ask about this? I have one more, actually. Please, go for What's it. What's the biggest pushback you get from people that you give this kind of training to? Where they're like, oh, we couldn't, or that won't work here, or you don't know what you're, this, that's not how this works. The biggest pushback I get from people is that would never happen to me. I would never do that. Interesting. And, I, you know, then you just, one of my standard slides now is recent headlines. And it's just, and, and you, when you look at how minor some of the starts are down that slope, that's the point I try to get across to people, is that, yes, you're a good person. Somebody in this conversation was talking about how, was it you, Callan, that basically the vast majority of people are, are decent, and sometimes they just have bad days. Well, a lot of these incidents with boundary violations start because someone's having a bad day. Yeah, they're fighting with their spouse, they broke up with their boyfriend, you name it, they're fighting with their parents. It's just a bad day, and that's the low moment, and then it starts. And they're not necessarily bad people, right? And I do distinguish between probably the majority of these instances being true traps, unintended things, at, from the predators. My, my Cyber Traps book is not about predators. Because predators will do this regardless of policy, regardless of whatever IT policies you have in place. They will figure out a way to do it because that is what their goal is. But what I'm really trying to help people understand is that technology has made these incidents easier and faster because we've lost reflection. And one of the slides actually that I showed yesterday was for teachers, and, and to some degree it applies to librarians, you know, disconnect get off of social media and the internet to begin with. Misdirect. If you're going to be online and you're in a public space, have a public persona for your anodyne conversations, but have a different persona for your life and keep it tightly wrapped in terms of who has access to it. And then reflection. If, you know, I, I talked about instead of posting it, post note it. You know, put it on a piece of paper and put it on your fridge for an hour and then decide to. And it sounds no, silly, it's, it's, you know, but seriously, it. if you're thinking about ranting online about your boss, write it out and think yeah. about it, right. you know? And it just will save the world so much trouble. Yes. You know, I think this is like I would like to teach the world to sing moment. We can, we can really minimize global angst if we did that. And I, I can think of a couple of people I would particularly recommend that to, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have access to those circles. Anybody does, by the way, you have my contact information. <laughs> I'm happy to, to do the lifting on that. Um, okay, what else? Anything to wrap us up?
There is one point I didn't have a chance to make that is a response to part of something you said about uh, retention and how you were surprised to hear that the video would be for yeah. the team room is purged every 24 hours. So we, there actually are some good things being done in the library world to, to help mitigate the risks of things being retained for longer than they need to be. So for example, at Sierra, where we have those notes about patients. Mm -hmm. um, that only retains a list of what people have checked out at any given time, what they have on hold or what they've been fined for. So everything else that they would be on their record is purged. Right. And so every year, uh, on July 1st, the beginning of the fiscal year, the whole database just it kills itself and starts over. <laughs> so it does track statistics up until that point, and then it just like takes it, like just wipes itself clean and then starts it fresh. People can't opt in to save their reading history. Yeah, they, I was going to say that. Yeah. yeah. So there is the choice. To but do they that. don't have to. They, yeah, they don't so have to. So it can not be safe. Well, yeah. choose not and to. readers and patrons get really huffy about this stuff. Yeah, they I do. They Am do. Am they Am do. Amazon, for instance, has, and, and actually I think Kate was part of this discussion. My sister Kate is, is Matt's wife. Um, but that would make sense. <laughs> I was like, there's so many nice leads. <laughs> well, that, that, that takes care of two of them, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but there was a debate going on on Goodreads about the fact that Amazon would not retain that information so you could see what you had read. And more importantly, people really wanted to know when they had finished a particular book. That was the piece of information that they wanted Amazon right. to pop up and then feed into Goodreads because there's a reading shelf on Goodreads and it gets very competitive. Right. So people wanted Amazon's help to kind of show off how good they were. Yeah. Um, uh, to, the, to speak to the opposite of that, um, so I'm um, from Leslie Sunberg, part of the Flow Network, and I was sitting in on some of the folio conversations, the new iOS they're developing, and yeah. um, it's something that I've kind of noticed where there seems to be a divide between librarians and developers who like libraries who are not trained as librarians mm -hmm. in that um, there's not a real, they don't really understand the emphasis around privacy and so a lot of people were asking, oh like what are, are you using a like, privacy guidelines for patient data? And one of the responses was just like, oh no, would you suggest one? And I was like, yeah, we have one from the ALA, it's called just like ALA privacy guidelines. <laughs> Everything you want to know probably in the title there. <laughs> This new iOS, like our how how is it set up? And they were like, oh, well, you can change it, but right now the detail, like the default, is to store patient data indefinitely. And we were all kind of like, oh boy, what? Yeah, like, yeah, you can change it, but like that, it just defaults to you know being able to store patient data indefinitely. And like we don't have tech people at those. Like we have like a small handful of librarians, and we were like, if someone wasn't like on guard for that, they would just install yeah, this yeah. iOS that just saves everything forever. I think even our current ILS is under the same, is threatened by the same things. So people who build that at Innovative, who I have very strong feelings about, but are oh, not yeah. positive. Um, <laughs> they, I mean, they may well decide at some point, like, they, they want to cave into the pressure for the people, from the people who want their reading list in a way that's easier to obtain. Yeah. And so we need to be mindful that those developers don't just decide they're doing that and yeah. fix that. Um, well, and, and you get into really interesting issues, I think, in terms of where is data actually being stored? If you're in these consortiums. Yeah, well, so Minuteman did just host us, finally. Okay. So now we are, like, our data is in Virginia. It used to be in Natick. It's in Virginia now. Well, I, I mean, it's in a nicer place, probably. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but, but really, the, que but the question then is, you know, and we run into this all the time in schools, who's got control over third-party data, you know, that's being held? If all of these schools are going now to Google Docs, um, and that raises really interesting questions. I mean, you read the terms of service, you should have a small heart attack in terms of what they can do with the data and what they think they own and what, you know. And, you know, I'm sure Kay could talk about this in much more detail. But. Well, and McGill University for a while was telling all of their academic faculty and uh, librarians to not use Google Documents because of the Patriot Act ability to yeah. get access to it because Google's a U.S. company. Mm -hmm. And Canada was like, we've got better privacy laws than that, but if you use Google and put your stuff on Google Docs, we can't keep it safe against you know, U.S. overreach 
people want. And that in Google does report out how many warrant requests they get, but they don't report out obviously what number of NSL requests they get. So you'd have really no way of knowing. Matt. Uh, this just made me think. We use until I reload this collection development tool, and that's all in Iliad. Um, and I'm not sure how that information gets disseminated to the subjects like the liaisons who are in charge of uh, growing that particular collection for that particular active member. So it just makes me think now how that information is disseminated. Well, and there's technological ways to divorce, you know, certain yeah. data from patron data. It's just that that's a, kind of a 200 level developer job, and we get 100 level developers most of the time. Right. Like you could encrypt a whole bunch of data and hang on to it. Sure. But it's kind of not where we are yet. And part of the issue here, and this is one of the things I think that was so powerful about the class last week, is that we need to train the next generation of administrators about what these issues are and what kinds of questions they should be asking. So for instance, do you have library directors now who are asking about encryption? You know, who are asking about where is our data stored? Because you know, there's transmission. Is it being transmitted in an encrypted fashion? How do we know for sure that there isn't some kind of splitter the way there was in San Francisco way back in 2004 that's dividing the data, quite literally, into an NSA pool and a keep going pool? I mean, that was the start of my book, American Privacy, was exactly that room in San Francisco that unfolded with you know, just complete horror, except Congress then proceeded to reaffirm the Patriot Act. But, feelings about that. Yeah. I guess for better one style, how do you fight helplessness? Because this is all really good information and like things that you yep. go around and you tell people about and then like after a while that can be so overwhelming and you know, just so like how do I even stop this in the first place? Or I already have so much out there, like what's the point of going back to this? Well, I, I guess I would give you two answers and then I'm welcome to hear what other responses are. Number one is you know, there is some minor safety in numbers, which is to say, you know, for instance, if your credit card gets hacked, which undoubtedly it has been, you know, somewhere, somehow, um, you're one of X tens of millions of credit card numbers out there. So the chances of you in particular having some injury as a result of that is relatively small. The chance of someone targeting you online because of what, you're po what you posted, you know, Let's, put, let's start with the government. The government's interest in you as an individual, presumably, is relatively low. Yes, there is a risk. There's a real risk, given the amount of information out there that it could be misused. But it's, it, it's this risk-benefit analysis. Are you going to stop using social media on the off chance that you know, Jeff Sessions is going to come after you? Well, that's you'll bet. That, I, I don't know you, but you will have to you'll have to figure that out. Jeff Sessions comes after you. All the ACL. Definitely want to know yeah. that. But, but the other answer the other answer to this, and, and I think the much more practical answer for all of us, myself included, is to be reflective about what you put out in the world. And no, you can't undo the internet. There's no redo button, you know, for the internet. Not an easy one anyway. But yeah, right. Yeah. But going forward, right, as you make decisions every day, you can make pro privacy decisions. That's just, you know, yes, I, you can succumb to helplessness and just say screw it. But none of us walk around naked even though, you know, we could conceivably argue we're naked online. I mean, we, we retain the ability to control what people see. So yeah, just make good decisions going forward. I mean, really, that's all we can do, um, is to be as mindful as possible about what we're doing online. I would say one more thing. Please. Which is, um, well, a couple things. One is that, yes, we can change our behavior. And, you know, you actually do probably have more privacy than you might think, right? I mean, if you're conscious of these issues, then you know, you're know you probably already doing things that are protecting you more than folks who are not thinking about these things. And there are other things you can do, too, that are really easy. Like, for example, if you want to get like a rewards card at CVS, you can just write a fake name. You know, like they don't care, actually. <laughs> um, right. and, and you can also 
you know, not buy an internet connected TV if you don't, you know, like you can, you can certainly make choices as a, as a consumer. And, and I always say, like, people will be like, wow, you use Google Maps? And I'm like, yeah, I need to get places. <laughs> <laughs> There's no other service that provides what Google Maps does. But there are a lot of other email services. I don't have to use Gmail, mm -hmm. you know. There are, like, a million email services that are just as good as, as Gmail. Um, so thinking about it in that way, too, like, do you actually need this thing that m might be taking your privacy um, and selling your information? Or could you use a different service that may protect you more? And in some cases, like with Google Maps, there's no, there's no alternative to mm -hmm. Google Maps, I don't think. That's, like, legit. Yeah. Um, so I use it, you know, because it's really good. It's a great service. <laughs> um, and it's free in exchange for my personal information, right? So I'm aware of that, but there's nothing else out there, really. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I would also say, like, just politically, that it's not enough just to do things that are, like, personally protective, right? But I have a friend uh, who's an organizer in New York, Miriam Kaba, and she does work on, around police and prisons. And she always says that um, hope is a, is a practice, right? It's like a political act to be hopeful. So I think that's really important. Um, and we shouldn't give up, ever. Because if you do that, you're basically dead. Spiritually. <laughs> um, and then, you know, Antonio Gramsci, the Italian philosopher, said something similar. He was like, he, I have a pessimism of the intellect and an optimism of the will. And that, that, I think, describes the way that I think about these issues and almost everything. Like, certainly climate. Like, not a great, not great. Facts aren't great, you know? But if we woke up every morning feeling a sense of dread and, like, fear about the ocean swallowing us, like, we wouldn't be able to eat breakfast or go to work or do anything, you know? So it's like, yeah, we know that shit is really bad. And at the same time, we have to believe that we can make the world a better place because if we don't believe that, it's not going to be a better place, right? So it's like a practice. It's like a political practice of being hopeful and trying. This, this is the distillation, though, of the lottery motto. If you don't play, you can't win. <laughs> Except in a much more socially positive way. Yeah, I mean, that's where it actually attacks on the poor. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I just, it, 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 it absolutely struck me, as, as Katie was talking, that that's, that's sort of the thing, right? And she's absolutely right. Look, little tiny things make a big difference. I went out and bought one of those, you know, steel Yeti thermoses. And now, you know, I'm using a few less paper and styrofoam cups, and it's a start. Mm -hmm. it, it will not change the state <laughs> of the Sargasso Sea appreciably, but it's a start. Mm -hmm. And that's, I would say that is true online as well. Just do little things and build them up. But I love the optimism piece. That, that's a great quote that I will repeat endlessly now. Just on a really practical level, I want to make another plug for the Library Freedom Project, which I know Kate and Jessamine both um, mentioned. Also because, though, it, um, it brings together some very specific tools that you can use. You know, I know, like, Jessamine mentioned Privacy Badger, right? Like, a very easy extension that you can put onto to your browser to help you, like, see if you are, you know, to help you see how um, secure some of the sites are and things like that. And so that, if you go to Library Freedom Project, you'll see lists of those tools and how to use them and stuff like that. And I think good for us to know that for ourselves, also good for us to be able to teach our patrons. So, so. All right, anything else? All right, we'll spend 10 minutes eating cheese and then <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or as long as we want. Anyway, thank you very much for coming today.